Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes. Yes, but it's on your other screen. It's on this one? It's on the one that says one through 34 and then gives your notes. Okay, hold on here. Same Good screen. Morning, you change your Zoom screen. Okay, hold on a second here. I'm going to. How's that? We see your email now. Oh, geez. <laughs> Morning, Susan. I'm trying hey. to. I'm trying to open my camera <laughs> and it, it will open for a second that it relocks. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Is that any better? There we go. You can still Lord. see it. It's fine. I don't know why I'm you, on. You got to put it on. Yeah. You got to put it on. Um, you want to use slideshow. There you How's go. That? There you go. Yay. Yay. <laughs> yeah, we apologize. Up. This is our first time, guys. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've, yeah. like, I've done this a few times. We, we just got electricity in New Hampshire. This is all brand new. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm glad you guys are back. <laughs> uh, count your blessings. Well, and I and I, I do have to I have to scoot for a national call at eleven. Uh, so I uh I have not grown bored. I just have to go at 1059, but I okay. appreciate you guys being here and, and you guys are in great hands because Susan Kenyon is uh, an absolute rock star instructor. I think some of you have seen her face multiple times. Um, so <laughs> we're fortunate you. to have her back. My ego. Sure. Oh yeah, you kidding, kid? I just text you every, every time we launch, I text you, I'm like, pick three dates. Yep. <laughs> pick three <laughs> dates, I'll be, your, I'll be your water boy. <laughs> And we have Connor Dowd here, uh, phenomenal OP from the Rhode Island area. Um, look at that stunning tie. What's up? Good to is be that, here. Is, is that your Cleveland victory tie? I love it. No, this is yellow, though. But I'm joking. I know. Hi, yeah. Colin. Connor, that's all right. Oh, Connor. Oh. Here we go. I'm off for a to start today. I've been called a lot worse, don't you worry. <laughs> yeah. He's an OP. He's heard worse. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. <laughs> People pop in, but if you guys are here for Ignite, making and receiving offers, you're in the right place. So you're in- Oh, right. This is an awesome class. I just um, had an offer accepted. Oh, way to go, oh, Isabel. Yeah, so this is like, I need this class. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, congratulations. That is so exciting. Thank you. It was yesterday. Wow. I think some of the group already know about this because that I was um, dealing with this yesterday. That's oh, awesome. very, very exciting. 
Is this for a buyer? Yes. Yes, I'm a buyer of these on this one. Yep. Great. Cool. And good morning, Lourdes. I see you there on chat. So I'll do my best to um, monitor the chat, but I know that um, Connor and Tim are going to help me with that as well. So we're going to get started. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Susan Kenyon, and I am with um, the Portsmouth, New Hampshire Market Center, and I'm licensed in um, New Hampshire and Maine. I have been licensed since 2013, and so when I teach, I, I know there's some familiar folks out there, so it's good to see you again. Um, I am in production, so I teach from the perspective of production. Um, so you will definitely have a flair of, you know, of production coming into the class today. Um, I am on, I'm a husband wife team. So we are spouses selling houses and we have a, a small team up here in New Hampshire. Um, and they already bought the copyright on that. So it's too late. <laughs> spouses selling houses, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's me. I'm really excited to be here for making and receiving offers today. Good morning, guys. My name is Tim Lindsay. I'm the productivity coach at 463 here with Susan. Our market center is in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And then we've got uh, offices in Southern Maine as well, all the way up to North Conway in New Hampshire. And we have agents who are also licensed to sell in Massachusetts. We don't have any brick and mortar down there. Uh, although if you are looking for referral partners in um, you know, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, or New Hampshire, uh, we are the house to call. So we'd uh, love to help you out with that. And uh, honored to be here with Susan. And we have Connor. I can't believe we have Connor. Good morning. So Good morning, perfect. everyone. My name is Connor Dowd. Um, I'm down here in Rhode Island. I'm licensed in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. I lead a team of six down here. I've been selling here for 23 years. Our team, I've got two buyer's agents. I handle the listing side and we do about 120 units a year. Uh, happy to be here. I'm, I'm on both sides of it and love to give some perspective. I think this is where um, good agents separate themselves from great agents. So happy to be here. Awesome. This is a really exciting class, you guys. So I'm glad that you're, you're able to make make it to make and receive offers because you know you've done so much work to get to the point of making and receiving offers um, which is is fantastic so I always like to start too with a couple of quick reminders that um, I'm trying to I will always try to keep this out of anything compliant to sp state specific rules uh, because we do practice in a bunch of different states here. So I don't want to get into any compliance issues as far as um, what one state can do over a different state. And also, you know, I always like to remind you that how you participate here is how you participate everywhere. So participation is really welcomed and encouraged. Feel free to pop something in the chat room, but even better than that, have your video cameras on so that I can see you guys and you, and you can see me and unmute yourself at any point that you wanna jump in and add a comment, ask a question or share an experience that you're having or have had, okay? And even if you have your camera off, we have software that cracked the code so we can see you eating. So just turn <laughs> your camera on anyway. Said with love. Yeah, just just be present. You know, you, you can't shut off your screen in a classroom, which we'd all love to be in a classroom right now. Uh, Susan, I also dropped in uh, the script book for Spark, uh, which is the first nine sessions. I dropped in the script book for Elementals, which is what we're in. And we dropped in the PDF for today's class. So if you guys want to open that up and follow along, if you're on your phone, uh, you cannot see uh, documents in the chat. So if you're having trouble locating that, uh, we would ask you to move to a computer if you can. Uh, otherwise, it is in the chat. Yep. Okay. And we will, let's get started. So, you know, I just love this slide. You guys have seen it every day during Ignite. And, you know, what is so fantastic and powerful about this slide is it's a reminder of how great Keller Williams is to have gone and asked successful agents, what do they do every day to be successful? And let's just do that, right? We don't need to recreate the wheel. And um, someone says, can you please drop them in again? I joined late. Thank you. If you could drop them in one more time, Tim. Um, you know, what, what do successful agents do every day? And it is an every single day thing. And guess what? It's still what, a, what successful agents do every day. We don't ever stop doing these things. So we start with the left side of our screen where we are growing our business. 
And, you know, we're, we lead generate for buyers and sellers. And I know you've heard lead generating every day that you've been in Ignite because it never goes away. This is, this is a sales job and it's all about the lead. We have to lead generate for new business um, and repeat business every single day for buyers and for sellers. So then we're making seller listing presentations and, and signing those listing agreement contracts. And we're making buyer presentations and getting those buyer, buyer agency contracts signed. And they are a contract. They're, they're bilateral contracts that are a contract between two parties. So it's not just someone hiring us. It's a contract where we're having a loyalty agreement where we're going to choose to work with each other. And we're previewing real estate every day. Why? Because we need to know our market. We need to know what um, inventory is looking like in the market. We need to know um, how fast properties are moving or sitting in the market and what that looks like. We have to know how to go into properties with our buyers so that we're looking at the property from the perspective of helping them as a buyer agent and helping them with things that they're not looking for, right? At In properties, like when they wanna make sure that their bedroom set's gonna fit in the master, master bedroom, we're looking at, you know, are there any signs of moisture damage on the ceiling? Um, is there possibly hardwood underneath this carpet? We're, we're looking at maintenance or deferred maintenance possibilities, things like that when we're previewing real estate with our, with our buyers. And then when we, you know, when we do all of those things, then we get the um, honor and the privilege to be able to run our business. So running our business looks like we have to market our seller listings, right? We, we did all that work lead generating. We got the listing agreement signed. Now we need to market that and get that property sold for our sellers. And we need to take our buyers shopping um, and, and get them under contract. We need to show them houses. And there's a skill to that. I know you guys had buyer consultations yesterday for Ignite, um, which is, is really a fantastic class. So we need to now, we, we get that buyer presentation done. We get those contracts signed. Now we take them out shopping. And then we get to where we are today, where we're going to negotiate contracts. We're going to make and receive offers and negotiate contracts as part of running our business. Um, transaction management to closing, that's going to be a fantastic session, the contract to close process for, our, for running our business. What do we do once, once they are under contract? And vendor management, there's a lot of vendors that will be popping in during that process, with, whether it's appraisals, appraisers or home inspectors. Um, there may be attorneys involved. There are vendors that we need to manage for getting this, um, getting this contract completed for our, for our folks. And we, we drive the bus. We got to drive that bus in every direction. It's, if something goes wrong, it's always the agent's fault. So it's our job to make sure that everybody in this whole process is doing their job and that they're doing it at the right time that all these resources are being pulled in when they're supposed to be being pulled in. Okay. And successful agents set goals and they look at their goals and they review them. And those goals can be monetary. You're like, how many families do I want to help this year? Do I, do I have a price point goal? Am I, is one of my goals right now trying to maybe elevate and increase my price point for the buyers and sellers that I'm working with? You know, what, is, what are your goals? Write them down. And we have to always be aware of compliance and risk management, right? Because this is a really big transaction and it's a really big deal. And right now, some transactions are just moving so quickly that there is risk involved for ourselves and for our clients. And we need to protect them from that. And sometimes that means pumping the brakes a little bit to make sure that we're not jumping in too quickly, that we're not making sure, you know, we want to make sure that our buyers and sellers are aware of the risks that they're taking as they enter into a contract, whether it be with contingencies or real estate law and practice in your area. Federal fair housing, right? That's a big one, compliance and and risk management around federal fair housing. So we have to attend training and get coaching on all of these things, which you're doing today. You're, you're getting training on how to go out into your marketplace and, and get business and get people through the transaction. 
and we need to manage money. So I always kind of stop here and say, we must manage our money. Otherwise we work so hard. We just listed off all of these things, 12 things before we even get to manage money that we have to do every day. Man, that's a, that's a lot of work. So if we're gonna do all of that work, we need to manage our money so that we have money at the end of the year. Because <laughs> the easiest people to sell to are salespeople and, and we're salespeople. I, I'm, I'm transparent, I'm guilty. People will call me and buy a subscription to this or pay for leads for that or give a donation to this. And I'm like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. But we have to manage our money. And when we have set goals around managing our money, when we get those phone calls, like we've set goals around marketing, like how much are we going to spend on marketing and stick to it so that when we get those phone calls from people wanting to sell us a subscription for something, we pump the brakes on that too, so that we're managing our money, we're paying our quarterly taxes. And at the end of the year, we have money in the bank to bring home to our families who have supported us in this crazy business that we chose to get into. A couple of quick notes about the money stuff. Um, first of all, Susan, it's really funny. Thank God everybody got a really good class in school when we were kids about managing money. They never talked to <laughs> yeah. us about that, right? Um, Luckily, you're at a brokerage that does uh, value profit first. Uh, when we do your CGI training, if you've used the CGI tool or even the tool uh, within um, command to, to budget, we always put profit first, right? Uh, most businesses uh, sell widgets, they pay their bills and whatever's left over is profit. We reverse engineer that to make sure we protect our profitability. That's how we're rated as market centers. Uh, that's how we honor you guys as agents. And when you get to the budget model, in business planning clinic, if you have that coming to your market center, uh, nationally, it's gonna be on the 20th and the 21st of October on KW Connect. When they talk about the budget model, it's 30-30-40. It's, it's, um, it's 30% 30, 30 cost of sale, 30% expenses, 40% profitability. Are you thinking, oh my God, on every dollar, I'm getting 40 cents? People struggle with that number. Uh, ask our good friend, Connor Dowd. Ask our, you know, he has conversations with his agents all the time. Profitability of 40% can be a struggle as you're building your team because you get outside the lines on the 230s. Um, so we're always going to drill down on that conversation about you guys guarding your profit, protecting your profit. And really, you guys can make a ton of money and have a dollar on December 32nd. You're like, what happened? Um, we just didn't, we didn't guard our expenses and our cost of sales. So that's what we're going to dive deep into. Uh, if you go nationally to KW Connect on October 20th and 21st, I believe it is 1 to 5 p.m., Eastern time. Uh, and we're in New England. So most of us, unless you're on vacation, God bless you for being here. Uh, you're on Eastern time right now. So mark that in your calendar for sure. And find out if your market center is doing a business planning clinic, either in person or virtually this fall. Absolutely. And is, is Matt Erdman doing the finance session for Ignite again? Uh, I'm going to double check. I'm almost positive he is. And that is, uh, that, that is must see TV. Your face Absolutely. should be in the room for that. Phenomenal. Yep. Phenomenal talent and a great class. And that's coming up in just a few days. Yeah, I, I, I had the honor of um, hearing him speak about money and finances in person at Family Reunion right before we all shut down. <laughs> and he really is very engaging and he breaks it down, the money piece into pieces that are understandable and easy to manage. So I definitely would make sure that you guys check out the calendar and, and don't miss that session of Ignite because it is very powerful and very important. Okay. All right. One piece that I didn't touch on, but uh, on this slide, but we're going to talk a lot about it in making and receiving offers is something I am extremely passionate about and that's your co-broke relationships. Okay, whether you're co-broking with somebody within Keller Williams or with another brokerage, that is part of what we have to manage um, for our clients. And it's and successful agents do this every day as well. We have we need to maintain really good co-broke relationships out there in the marketplace. And we're going to talk about how to do that and why it's important as we go through today. Okay, so we're going to talk about the process here the offer process. This is kind of our roadmap for the day. We're gonna talk about the offer process, preparing the offer, writing the offer, presenting the offer, responding to offers. Um, all of those are super important. And, and the offer process is when we're working with buyers and sellers, we need to be talking about the offer process really 
right from the beginning of the relationship. And this is a relationship, right? We're in relationship with our clients and our customers. And we're in relationship with all the people that we talked about on that last slide for vendor management. This business is really all about relationships. So when we're talking to our buyers and sellers right from the very beginning, we should be dripping in information about the offer process because we don't want it to be like a fire hose as soon as they find some, a property that they want to make an offer on where we're now like giving them more information for the first time all at once that it's so difficult to absorb. So when we start talking about the process from the beginning of the relationship, it will make it easier and less stressful for our buyers and sellers. Okay. Susan, one thing about uh, kind of to touch on that is when I'm when I'm meeting with agents and, and working with my team, our job as successful realtors is to set expectations for our clients all through the process, as Susan was talking about. So it's not just about the, the offer piece. It's about all the way through the transaction. And maybe you can't cover all that on a buyer consultation meeting or a listing presentation, but Keep in mind that we have to be thinking three steps ahead of our client. We have to be able to see issues come up before they actually happen. So keep that in mind when you're going through this process, because that makes for a, a, a more successful and smoother transaction when you can be talking about things that may happen. And then when they come up, they're not as big of a deal. You can handle them. They were prepared. But if you're not preparing clients for what may happen, that, that, can, pre, that can create a, a rocky environment. So just keep in mind. And I, the other piece I wanted to add in is think of yourself as the quarterback uh, on a football team. You're in charge. You need to know where your players are. You need to make changes if you need to. You need to be able to look at the defense um, and make adjustments as needed. But you're the captain, and that's an important piece, and you've got to keep that in mind. Yep, absolutely. That's a great point. I'm glad that you are bringing that up because we do need to set those expectations throughout the whole process. Um, and, you know, when they, if we're not setting the expectations, the client might have an expectation that they haven't verbalized that we may not be meeting. So we yep. need to ask those, those kind of leading questions and make sure that we ask, do you have expectations that I'm not meeting? Am I meeting all of your expectations? We've been talking about this so much. We talked about it this morning on our quick start at, at our market center. Um, we hear agents all the time. I'm sure Connor hears this as well. Um, agents that are struggling with managing client expectations. And it is, it is so difficult to do that when we never set the expectations in the forefront, right? So to, to Connor's point, as the quarterback, you quarterbacking the deal is making sure that you have command of the field and everybody uh, you, use the word ready and, 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 and prepared and for sure, like, we as the agent won't be ready for the objection, won't be ready for things that come up, but we can be prepared for it. In the preparation, anything that does pop up, we can be prepared for that. We don't know what's coming next, but being prepared for what's coming next and then setting that expectation because most of our clients might be buying their first house or maybe their second house and that could be their last house. They go through this process maybe twice a lifetime and you guys are going through the conversation and the preparation every day. So setting expectations at the forefront is going to help you manage them throughout the transaction. And it's going to be a better user experience for your clients that will create raving fans. So don't be afraid to set expectations. This is your business and you are their trail guide and they're, they're, they're you're holding their hand through the process and they want to be led. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so we're going to jump right into the offer process. And, it, and this really is what it looks like. Um, again, there, there may be state specific requirements. So if you have a state specific question, ask your leadership about that um, and, and they can help you. But the buyer, so we're going to start with the buyer makes the offer. And that's super exciting. And right now it's hard to, for buyers to make offers and get them accepted. But I'm seeing that lighten up a little bit here in New Hampshire and Maine. Um, so the buyer makes the offer. So you have to review the purchase and sales really line by line when you're, when you're making that offer with your buyer. You should be reviewing your, your purchase and sales agreement or your offer paperwork line by line with your buyer so that they know exactly what they're getting into and what every line means. Um, the buyer makes the offer and you know, the seller can respond in one of three ways. 
they can accept the offer as it is. They can counter the offer. And remember, anything in the contract can be countered. It's not always about price. There could be other terms in that um, contract that the seller may want to counter. Um, or the seller can just reject the offer altogether. And we see that happen, right? If, uh, if buyers, there's, there's all, you're going to have a buyer that is always going to want to go in and lowball, even in this market. It's just the nature of, of some buyers. Um, and the thing about the seller side of that is sometimes sellers can be like, I'm just not even going to respond to that offer. I'm, I'm just going to reject the offer. I'm not even going to counter. Okay. That doesn't mean that that buyer can't submit another offer for that same property. It definitely can happen. I've even had, um, which I, I think is a genius idea. I just had uh, on, I had the seller side, I had a buyer's agent send me two offers for the same property for the same buyer with different terms. So it was great because it really gave my seller some options on price, on contingencies, on levels of risk, on, on which offer that if they wanted to move forward with one of them, which one was going to resonate with them more. So that I thought was very creative. Have, it, have you guys, have you seen that down there, Connor? I haven't. Um, I so it's a, you said it was the same buyer offering two different offers with different terms based on different contingencies, but it's on the same property. Yeah, I yeah. haven't seen that. That's interesting, though. You, you know, and I'll tell you, it was it was really great because at one price they could get an appraisal waiver. At a different price, they couldn't get the appraisal waiver, and that was a risk issue for us because we were really pat. We were. You know, we're pricing things at the top of the market right now because it's a seller's market. But my That's seller- What happened in that scenario? So in that scenario, the other offer was actually for $10,000 more, but it was the, but they couldn't get an appraisal waiver. Yeah. But my seller, we're stacking up deals. So my seller has to, um, has a home, has, has to purchase a home as well. So for them taking the $10,000 less with no appraisal and no inspections was- uh, much less of a risk than getting a higher price with an appraisal because it put their their future purchase in a much less risky category. Hmm. Another thing that I've heard of in a different market, very different market, but for agents just to keep in mind and tuck away for a rainy day is what's called a reverse offer. And that is in a situation where you're in a, um, you know, deep buyer's market and sellers are just trying to unload their houses and you've got people that are just not coming off the fence where actually the seller identifies a buyer that seems to show significant interest and actually presents them with an offer to buy the house. So obviously yep. in a different market, but keep it in mind for when the market shifts down the road. You know, because that could happen so quickly when when things shift like that. And, and something to keep in mind here is, you know, when we get to the point when we're working with our buyers and sellers and there's an offer on the table, emotions can get very high, but they cannot get high with you. Your emotions are not allowed to get high in this, in this situation. It's our obligation to our buyers and to our sellers that we keep this professional, that we are the most professional person in this whole transaction. We don't have tone we maintain a strong relationship with both sides of the buyer and the seller side here. And we want to give people grace so that, for example, maybe a buyer is submitting a very low offer and the seller may have a personality where they, they're very high energy. Maybe they're very high emotion. They may, we need to be delivering that low offer in a professional manner so that we're giving them the option to respond in with calmness. We don't want to, if it's a, it's a really low offer, we don't want to call up our seller and be like, I have an offer for you. It's a really crappy one. You're probably not even going to want it. I mean, how we communicate to our seller is how the rest of this part of uh, an offer is going to go. Really th the great news is, and if that I were in that scenario, my script would be, Hey, Connor, I have great news for you. We have an offer on your property. 
It's a little low, but it's a great way to start the conversation. And now you're giving them a different way to look at a low offer because really an offer is the beginning of the conversation. I have two scripts on that. One of them is in a market that we're in right now, which, you know, because not all the offers are coming in, you know, asking or, or, or above. Right. So in situations where, um, the offer is less than asking, and maybe we've got some work to do on that offer, which maybe doesn't happen that often, but it happens. So my script is, good morning, Susan, got good news and bad news. What do you want first? And for most of it, you know, I ask them, I said, good news is we got an offer. The bad news is we've got some work to do. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just my opening script to them. And it usually puts them at ease, but in a more balanced market or a buyer's market, this goes back to the point about setting expectations I set expectations with sellers about the potential for lowball offers during the listing presentation process. I warn them that it can happen. I warn them that not to overreact. I warn them that it's not the it's not where an offer starts, it where it's where an offer ends. So I set all this stuff up so that when the offer comes in that's low, I will start with Good morning, Susan. I have good news. We have an offer. Remember when we were talking about the listing presentation, I was talking to you about the potential of a low ball offer. And she'll say, yes, I remember. Setting expectations, I'll, right? Perfect. Yeah. And yeah. I'll say, guess what? We just got one. And she'll say, oh, okay. All right. You warned me about this. And I'll say, okay, I know we're listed at 800, but the offer came in at 675. And she'll, in many cases, in many cases, the seller will say, if you prep it, if you set it up the right way, they will say, okay, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. You know? <laughs> and you can hear them take that breath, can't and, you? And then you can start to focus on it. But if they yeah. don't understand that, you're right. Like they could absolutely lose it. And, and I started doing that when I started having sellers lose their mind on me or on the phone. So when I set it up better, there's less of a chance. It doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but that's all about setting the expectations. It's all about the scripts. It's all about the attitude. It's all about your language, your tonality, all that stuff happens, helps. So good point. Abs absolutely. And, and remember that we, we do need to manage our own emotions. So when a, a buyer's agent sends that offer that is low, don't take it out on them because mm -hmm. we do what our clients instruct us to do. So if their client is instructing them that they wanna make an offer and they wanna start out low, we still maintain a positive relationship with the co-broke because it's, it's business for me and the co-broke, it's not personal. And there's still a very good chance that we could get this offer um, under contract with some negotiation. Mm. So buyer makes an offer, the seller wants to counter, now we're negotiating. Remember that when you are writing the offer, everything has to be in writing. So we can't leave anything that is pertinent to the offer um, being verbal. And when we're going, when we're negotiating and we're landing on terms, um, everything has to be in writing. And right now we have buyers that are going to open houses without agents, without their agent. And coming back and saying, I want to put an offer on this property. And if you weren't there with them and they heard something at the open house that doesn't get written into the contract, it doesn't count. So that's an expectation that we need to set with our buyers as well. And we need to remind them, did anything else happen at the open house? Was something said at the open house? Like, you know, oh yeah, the seller definitely intends to replace that carpet that has a big stain on it. So that doesn't get written, written into the contract. It doesn't happen. So we have to ask them leading questions on what their expectation. Did something happen at the open house? Did something happen at this showing that we're not putting in writing that we need to circle back and, and get in writing before we submit an offer? Connor made such a great point about, you know, setting that expectation with the seller, first of all, and to an, to an extent, telling the story of the buyer that's about to approach them, reminding them that when they bought that house, did you go in over ask? right? Which 20 minutes ago, yes, all last summer we did. But historically, did you go in and ever ask or did, did it take some negotiating and be, being prepared for that? And, and, and I'm sure Connor said this to his agents as well. The best response to an offer is a response. 
Like unless, unless you have 15 offers on the table and one of them is like $4 and a chicken, like you don't have to call them back, but it's best to call everybody back uh, and just, and re just respond, especially if you have somebody and we haven't seen this for a while, Lord knows if you have somebody who's been marinating, <clears throat> excuse me, marinating in the marketplace for a while. And for the first time in 38 months, they get an offer. And they're like, we're not responding to that. Like, no, wait a minute. You, somebody just asked you to dance for the first time in three years. You should probably call them back and just investigate the conversation, right? Um, but, I, you know, we're doing what, if our, if our seller says, don't respond to the Lindsay's, respond to the Dowds and the Kenyans, then we're going to be obedient and we're going to do what they say. But we can also guide them in, in keeping the door open and the conversation open to explore and exhaust those for the best. It's also about being professional. Going yep. back to kind of Susan's point is, we're all in this together. And while some people think that it's one agent against another, we're representing our clients, but we're in the same industry and we need to work together and we need to be professional and we need to be calm. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the stuff that I see agents put in, in writing. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Nathan and, Dickey joins um, you in the basement. Yeah, For text sure. message, all that kind of stuff. So going back to this low, low ball offer, do you know how many times I have sent over an offer that may the other side may deem to be um, low and I get scoffed at? I get not as much anymore because I've been in the business, but it, it tends to happen to a newer, newer agent. But sure. listen, when I get a low ball offer on one of my listings in a more traditional market, my response is, hey, Tim, just touching base, Connor Dowd from Keller Williams. Hey, we received your offer. I first of all want to say thank you. I appreciate the offer. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the seller's not overly excited about the number. We've got some work to do. We're going to see if we can try to find some common ground. Their initial response was absolutely no because of the gap that we have. Sure. I understand the buyer doesn't want to have to pay any more than they have to. And my seller's looking to get the best deal they can. So what I did was I tried to give you something that you can take back to your buyer. Absolutely. Keep in mind, my seller just initially said, no, I worked on them. I've got a counter offer for you, but I'm going to warn you to get this done. Your buyer's going to have to come up. So mm. that that's by the way, a real script that I have in, 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 you know, in many cases when we've got a low offer and that I always try to get some sort of a counter offer mm -hmm. because what that does is it keeps the process going makes the buyer feel better, but I've also put them on notice. Listen, I got you a counter, but I'm just warning you, we're going to have to get the buyer out. But I was respectful to Tim. I didn't scold him. And you know what? That helps in the long run because I have agents that want to do business with me because I'm, yeah. I'm it's not that I'm a, a pushover, but I'm, I treat them fairly. Mm -hmm. I treat them professionally. And let's, the goal here is to get the deal done if it's meant to be done. So keep that in mind. Yeah, yep. we had a we had a we had a client um, uh, back when I was in production who uh, great agent up in the Lakes region. Uh, their seller and my buyer, we took about three weeks off. Like we broke up, and we thought about it. And he called me back. He's like, "Chad's still alive." I'm like, "Yeah." And he's like, "My sellers are still alive. Let's get these kids back in the ring." And we brought it back together and they, and and closed. But everybody has to like calm and cool. Like like if Susan hasn't said it yet, she's gonna say it. We bring water to a fire, not kerosene. Right? We are we are we are in between our clients to inject professionalism and to keep the conversation going uh, until it's natural end where everybody defines success as either to buy the property or not buy the property. But we've got to park our egos. Most expensive thing in real estate is our egos and we are here to serve our clients. And, and to Connor's point, most of the agents you're gonna work with are the 20% that do the 80%. So when you're out there rubbing elbows with these agents, we wanna, we wanna remember that we are working together, that our clients might come and go, but we're gonna be, I'm gonna be working with Connor Dowd in Rhode Island for years to come and you want to you want to take care of that relationship so you can work together as cobrokes in the future yep absolutely and you know when when we are at this point the offer the offer has been made um we have to now keep that momentum going momentum once an offer is made momentum is important to the buyer and to the seller so the buyer makes the offer if the offer gets accepted right from the get-go without any negotiations, then just get your signatures done so that you can get under contract. If your counter offer, if the seller is countering, then keep some momentum around the counter. You don't wanna let days go by without responding to counters. Um, 
you know, you want to, you want to lock that up and figure out if this is going to be somebody that you're going to be getting under contract with. Um, if you have a buyer that wants to buy and a seller that wants to sell, there is middle ground that you can find to get these parties together. And if it is rejecting the offer, then reject it. And then I, I do agree with Connor that no doesn't always mean no. So even if a seller does reject an offer, you can invite that buyer's agent to circle back with a different offer. If you can't get the seller to counter with a specific number, if price is the issue, then invite that buyer's agent to go back to their buyer and come back to the table again with something else that happens. And there's, uh, you know, still a good chance if you have a buyer that wants to buy and a seller that wants to sell that you can make that marriage happen. Just reject it with a smile. Yeah. Just reject it with a smile. Susan, Absolutely. I tried to get you a counter. We're just too far apart. Please go back to your buyer, see if you can get them up. And then I, I will work to try to get something. But right now my seller's a little discouraged. The other point I wanna make on the, on the offer, I know we're not talking about necessarily how to make offers, but in this market, especially if you're competing, you've gotta make sure that offer is tight and professional and correct and accurate. No misspellings, have everything correct. <laughs> yeah. Make sure the seller's listed correctly. Make sure your numbers make sense. Make sure we're not closing on Labor Day. Um, make sure you've got your pre-approval. Make sure your pre-approval matches what you've got for your mortgage contingency. Talk to the listing agent about what's important to the seller uh, in terms of closing and contingencies and all this stuff. I will tell you that clean, tight, professional offers are so much better received than the ones that come in piecemeal, that have misspellings, that have mistakes, that have owner of record written on them when it should have the correct seller. Put the, get that stuff ready to go that shows who you are and how you're going to be to do a deal with. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. And that's, that is the process um, in, a, in a nutshell, but we're going to keep going and get a little more in detail on preparing the offer. And there is a checklist here for preparing the offer. And I, I think this is in your materials as well. So they'll, you'll actually get the whole, um, the whole checklist, but you should have this. So when you are sitting down to write the offer for your buyer, have your checklist out. And um, that was a great site. Connor knew exactly where we were going <laughs> um, in preparing the offer because you do need that pre-approval letter, right? And, and the tool, this, this checklist can be found in your toolkit for Ignite. Um, how much of this can you do, should you do ahead of time? Really all of it. Like you should have this offer prepared before you get on the phone with your buyer so that you can review it um, carefully with them. And you are going to want to start with getting a buyer's pre-approval letter and connecting. It's not just getting the letter. It's that you've connected with their lender, that you are solid on what their finances are, what their ability to purchase is, what their loan types are going to be um, when, when you start writing that offer. And, and you do not want to be presenting the offer without this. You really, if you haven't done this first piece of the checklist, you shouldn't be out shopping with with that buyer time is precious to them and time is precious to you right when we go back to that very first slide of all the things that you have to do to be a successful agent for growing your business and running your business nowhere in there is there time to take buyers out shopping who don't have the ability to buy right so get that pre-approval letter find out who the, the buyer your buyer's lender is connect with them be in relationship with them that is offering great service to your buyer. It's also offering great service because you know what we don't want to happen? We don't wanna take them shopping, have them find the home of their dreams only to circle back with the lender and find out they don't have the ability to purchase it. Okay? We, we don't wanna do that to them. Okay? So connect with, connect with, the, um, with the lender. Um, you know, before showings is to, is to prepare your client on how to be a strong buyer. And this is part of what we're going to be doing when we're preparing the offer. The other thing that we're doing is we're going to, um, you know, you can produce a competitive market analysis so that you should be running comps. So I don't do a professional, like pretty full color CMA for writing an offer, 
but you do need to look at the market for your buyer so that they know that they're putting an offer in and, and what what are comparable homes sold for in that range of you know three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage, whatever, in this town, in this neighborhood. Know your market and your industry so that you're writing a, an offer that's appropriate. Because again, we're, we're gonna need uh, most likely an appraisal to happen, right? Unless you have a cash offer or someone's putting a lot of money down. The appraisers are gonna be looking at this purchase price and they're gonna be lining it up against um, similar properties that have closed. Um, review the tax records for information about pricing history. This is really important um, for a couple of reasons. We want to a confirm that the sell that the at the seller information and the property information within the listing is accurate. We want to make sure that everything that they put in there it, that it's it's legal, it's correct. It's if they have they're marketing it as a two a, a two unit home, but your tax records show that it's a it's a single family home. Then you have some investigating to do. How come on, when we showed up, it really is two apartments when the town thinks that it's a single family home? You need to do some digging and and verify what the listing is, what the property is, based and uh, against the tax records. Did they do work without permits? Is it a 1950s home and you go in there and there's like a brand new kitchen and when you look at the tax records, there's no sign of any permits being pulled. You need to ask some questions about that because we don't want to get our buyers into a situation, right? That whole compliance and, and risk situation. There's risk around work being done to a property without permits. Okay. What if it's new? What if it's a complete of a flip? If the tax records, the property card shows that the somebody bought this house, the seller bought this house and it, it was bought from a foreclosure and they bought it a year ago and they've renovated it and flipped it and now they're putting it back on the market, the amount of taxes are, that they've been paying is significantly going to increase. Is that going to do something to your buyer's ability to make that mortgage payment? Is it going to bump them their uh, ratio so that they actually no longer qualify for purchasing that home? And if you're working with buyers that are a little bit more tight on cash, that's a, a, a scenario that you want to make sure that you avoid. Is it new construction that was done the last time the tax taxes were um, prepared on that with the with the municipality that the tax the tax rate hasn't caught up with? the current status of the new construction. So those are all things that you're gonna look at when you're preparing the offer and you're looking at tax records. Does anyone have any questions on that? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I know that um, recently I learned with my coach that um, on a flip, you mentioned flips that FHA buyers, you know, you have to be careful of the date it was purchased because um, you can't, um, an FHA buyer can't buy it within, I think Three it's months. 90 days of yeah. the sale or the, the flipper purchasing it. Yeah. So then absolutely. And that's a great way to be in relationship with your lender, right? They should be guiding you with that type of information. Um, but Charles, thank you. That's a really great point too. There are guidelines um, for when that property had been recorded in the registry of deeds and when that can go under contract for an FHA buyer. Plus, right, when we're talking about different loan types, there's all kinds of things that we have to know for our buyers. Like, are there property conditions that are not conducive to the loan type? Like peeling paint, like broken windows, like missing railings on more than three steps. Um, all of those types of things. So no, you know, that that is not by mistake that the pre-approval information is, is right at the top because it really plays a very large role in what properties you should be making an offer on. And let's back it up even further, what properties you should even be showing your buyers, right? We're lining up properties that are in alignment with what their wants and needs are, with what their loan types are, what they can afford, so that we're not wasting anybody's time. We're not wasting the buyer's time, your time, or, or the seller's and the, the seller's agent's time. A couple points on that in terms of um, protecting your clients. One I see, as we talked about in terms of zoning, 
what is the legal status of that property? Um, and a lot of times you see it in multifamily properties in terms of, is it a two family? Is it a legal three family? So whatever. I just had a situation in Providence um, where the tax assessor had it down as a two. And he, they had three gas meters. There was a lot of questions and I'm just like, is it a two? Is it a three? And I've got to deal with fire code issues. I got to deal with this. I said, you know what? I am not putting this on the market until I have a zoning certificate. So I said, here's what you're going to do. I said, you're going to go into town, the town hall, city hall and request a zoning certificate. He did. It cost him 50 bucks. Typically the seller had to do it. Long and short, it's a legal three family. So I, I could market it that way. And that was the that was something I put on MLS. I market it that way. So the, the listing agent should really be able to provide that. If you get to a scenario where the buyer's agent's pointing something out, shame on the listing agent for not being ahead of it. But if it got missed, that's something you typically should have done. The other piece is uh, when we're dealing with septics, if you're dealing with a septic system, you can't call it a four bedroom house if it's a three bedroom legal septic system. So that's something you can find out through DEM or you know, in, in terms of how old the system is, but that's a, that's a big piece for, because the seller's gonna wanna know, I, I wanna know if I'm marketing correctly, as a buyer's agent, you're gonna wanna make sure that jives. So the buyer's agent should be checking also to confirm what's the legal status as it relates to septic systems. So keep that in mind. Absolutely. And you know what? The um, folks at town halls and city halls, they are really, in general, great when you call them to ask them questions about a property. So if the listing agent hasn't done all of their homework, hasn't put all of that information on the MLS, then you need to do that, right? That's the whole quarterbacking piece or driving the bus in both directions piece that you are responsible for making sure that you're writing a clean offer, that your buyer knows what they're getting into call up the building department, call up the um, tax assessor's office, get the answers to those questions so that you know what you're getting your buyer into. And, you know, you're going to, in this market, ensure that the property is still available before spending any time writing the offer. And we do that by calling the listing agent. So before we prepare to write the offer, before we write the offer, we're calling up that listing agent. Is the property still available? Okay. I have a question. And, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. So I went to show a property to my husband because he's an investor. And uh, I guess the listing agent uh, uh, couldn't come. So he just, he just put someone to cover him. He didn't know all the answers. But it seems like this house is in province. It seems like it's a little complicated because the, the owner of the house uh, is renting the one of the garage in the, I don't know where is the property line. I don't know about all the completed garage, if he's still gonna be uh, coming with the house. So I don't know if I should go ahead, like you mentioned, to go to the city hall and check about it, or I just wait for the, the listing agent to respond because I, I take so, uh, a few days after to let that I wanna put an offer, but he has me, answer bank. So I don't know what should I do. I tell you what, if, if that were me, I would be making those calls myself. I, I don't like if I have a listing agent that's not getting back to me in a timely manner, I'm going to give them grace. They might have something going on, but I would be calling and getting verification from the town on stuff like that. So it's certainly if you have a buyer and, and even if, if it's if it's your husband or someone that you related to, they're still your buyer. You can still call and get answers to those questions on their behalf um, so that you can move that ball forward as, as you know, because once someone's ready to make an offer, momentum is important. You yeah. never know when somebody else is going to go in there behind you and be more aggressive than you for getting that property under contract. Um, so you, you think I should call to the city hall and ask about the property line, what comes with the house? Because this uh, right now, I know the garage is renting, but on the leasing, it's, it says it comes with two go car garage. So I would call. I, I would call. I mean, I would call and find out what the town is saying that property consists of and get answers to those questions. And then you can also verify, you know, have that conversation with the listing agent when you're able to connect with them that, hey, I called down to City Hall. This is what they told me about the property. What do you know about this? And then you guys can have that conversation. All right. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. And um, thanks for jumping in there, Lourdes. 
and you know, the other thing is, is we need to call the listing agent, well, to find out that if the property is still available and also to find out, you know, what's important to the seller. We're in a very competitive seller's market right now. Price is not everything. It's not always about price. So we need to ask those questions of the listing agent. And it's just like, you know, it's very easy conversation. You know, hey, Lourdes, I'm, I just showed the, your property on 123 Main Street. My buyers are very interested. We're going to be writing an offer. Can you, you know, what other than price, what else is the most important to your sellers? You, it might be that the seller has to find suitable housing. You might be, it might be closing date. They might prefer a fast closing date. They might want a couple of, uh, a longer closing date. Um, when it's very competitive, I have, you know, and you can find clues at a showing and you should be looking for them when you're at the property. For example, I showed a buyer a home and I could tell the listing agent was at the showing as well. It was, I could tell it was an older person and I'm asking leading questions of the, the listing agent so I can find out as much about the seller as possible. That it was an older lady that lived in the home and she was moving down south by herself to, you know, so she had to pack up her house by herself. She didn't have any family here to help her. So I had a conversation with my buyer that I know it's an older person living there. She's gonna have a challenge emptying that house there are other people that are interested in the house. Are you interested in putting an offer for, forward that says they don't have to empty the house if they don't want to? Now, what that's going to look like is we could show up and the refrigerator could have food in it. But if that's something that you want to do, then you know make your buyer aware that there are sometimes situations or things that you can offer that are out of the box or not really very typical in a transaction that might put their offer ahead of somebody else. It's not always about price. And my buyer got that for an under listing price um, below what the listing price was. So call and find out what is going on with the seller from the listing agent. It's also your opportunity to build rapport because one of the things that we're also selling when we're putting an offer in is ourselves, right? We want to sell ourselves to the listing agent. We want that seller to know that if they move forward with our, my buyer, I'm going to be a great co-broke to work with. So I, it gives me an opportunity to sell myself to that listing agent that I'm going to be easy to work with, that I have reasonable expectations with my buyer. And having that professional on the other side of the transaction makes it a smoother transaction for the seller side as well. If I've got multiple offers as a listing agent and all things are pretty equal, I definitely will, while it's not my decision, I definitely will take into account um, who's on the other side and who I think we're going to have a smooth deal with. And I will have that conversation with the seller. If there's an agent that's out there that is just notoriously difficult to deal with, and um, as opposed to someone who, who is just pleasant and is going to do a great job and be on top of it, the goal here is to get to a closing table. So that, that all comes down to you know, how you act and what your professional level of professionalism is. So keep that in mind as we're going through the process. Yep, absolutely. This is where that co-broke relationship starts. It may, and it may be with someone that you've worked with before, which, is, which if that was a good experience, that is great as well. Um, but, you know, how we communicate with the listing agent is how they're going to go back and communicate with the seller. So we want to communicate with them in a way that they're gonna go back to their seller. And what I mean by that is we're scripting them without them knowing that we're scripting them. So if, for example, maybe your offer is less than asking price, we don't want them to go back and say, oh my gosh, you got an offer and it's less than asking price. Because guess what? There's a lot of agents out there that will go back and deliver the message that way because they don't spend time training and knowing that they shouldn't be doing that. They take things personally. Other agents in this market take things very personally. So we have to speak to them in a way that will help keep their emotions down so that when they speak to their seller, they're delivering the message we want them to deliver. So if we're putting an offer in that may be less than asking price in this market, we're going to call them and talk to them and say, you know, we are definitely putting in an offer. My folks really love the house. We are coming in a little lower than asking price. This is the reason why 
we ran some comps. We're concerned about appraisal. We're, this is the best that my, we're putting our best foot forward first so that when they go back and talk to their seller, you know, maybe I have a very young couple. This is the best offer that they could make with the financing that they have in place, but they are working with a really great local lender. That's what I want them to go back and tell their seller, not, yeah, you got an offer, but it's less than asking, right? Maybe when we're communicating, you know, it could be on other terms, like maybe I have to write in there that they have to, you know, we need for them to put a railing in because I have an elderly client or I have an FHA buyer. I need to communicate that to this listing agent when they're going to be um, presenting the offer to their seller, you know, this might seem like a, a small, uh, like something they shouldn't ask for to put the railing in, but I know that they're the, I talked to the buyer's agent and she let me know that the buyer has to use a cane and getting up and down those stairs is going to be an, a process for them. And they don't have the ability to install that railing. So they are asking for that, but I don't think it would be too big of a deal for you to do it. So, you know, you're going to communicate with them how you want them to communicate to their seller. Does that make sense? The other thing I was going to add is um, right now we're in a market that's so competitive, right? That the offers that we're writing, you know, are, you know, some of it's way over <laughs> asking. I'm going to waive this. I'm not going to do inspections. I'm, you know, I'm going to give you my firstborn, a closing, like all this stuff. It's crazy. Um, you need to make sure that you have a real conversation with your buyers and you're looking at them in the eye and making sure that they understand what they are putting in writing because sometimes you get caught up in the moment and then all of a sudden there are eight offers and you get that call and you say, congratulations, your buyer got it. And then you call your buyer and then a day sets in like, Oh my God, we waived inspections. We don't have a mortgage, you know, like all this yeah, stuff. Yeah, we didn't really that. mean that. Like, yeah. So you got to be careful. You got to make sure they understand. And it's clear because if you don't make it crystal clear as to what they're agreeing to, sometimes they can come back and say, Tim, I'm not sure. I, I didn't realize that's what that meant. <laughs> I, I, I didn't under, I, I, I didn't, I missed that. Like, and all of a sudden you're like, well, were we not in the same transaction? Like, yeah. so trust me, you want to make sure they understand what they're committing to because there is a chance they're going to get this house. They need to understand that they've just waived this or they don't have this or whatever it is. So just keep that in mind. If you've joined the yeah, industry in could... the last 19 months, like Gary <laughs> said, at the onset of COVID, we are doing business as unusual. So there are a lot of things taking place right now in transactions in order to get our clients to the finish line that aren't a, uh, a normal path of facilitation. So to Connor's point, there's no nuance in the contract. I'll, uh, the, the great Nathan Dickey would say, the contract does not care about your feelings. It's got to be crystal clear that you're on the same page. Um, John Duffy, one of our great senior agents up here said, you know, as agents, we work with our clients until the contract is written. Then together with our clients, we work with the contract. Like they have to understand there's, there's no shades of gray. The paper's white, the ink is black or blue or the dot sign, the docu yeah. signs. Yeah. Um, they've got and, to know exactly what that means. And we want it absolutely. To, to Connor's point, crystal clear for the other agent on the other side of the table. Like, well, I thought you would understand what we meant. Like it, once it's, once it's out the shoot and if somebody agrees to it, you waived inspections, you know, you waived yeah. appraisal, all those things. Yeah. And that means that if you waive inspections, that means that after you go under contract and your dad, who is a contractor, wants to go in and see it and make sure it's okay, you can't call that seller up and say, well, just I just want my dad to see it because he's in the business and, you know, just for informational purposes only. Your time for that is over. So you have to be very clear and very direct with your buyer and, and make sure that you're doing a good job for them. And it's okay sometimes for, uh, you know, if they don't get this, you, you got to keep their, their spirits up to go after the next one. So when we're having this checklist to prepare an offer, a lot of this is done ahead of time. You might be doing this more than once. So you need to really stay in communication with your folks and keep momentum going. We want to inquire about the activity on the property. Are there other offers? We, you can't assume that there are, you know, if, if there aren't any other offers, maybe you don't need to be going in over asking price, right? So ask the question. Um, make sure that you have the seller's disclosure. 
if the listing agent hasn't put that information up online, you need to call and get that information. Um, find out if there um, have been other offers. If so, what is the, what's their status and why did they fall through? If you have, can see through the history of the listing that it was under contract and then it came out, uh, it, it was under contract and then back on the market, ask those leading questions for, um, as you're preparing to write the offer. Okay. And then after that, we're, we're going to jump right in and um, the checklist to, to write the offer. So that was all just in the prep work to do that. And this is this checklist it's for writing the offer is also in your resource guide. Okay. So when we're writing the offer, these are all things that you are very clearly going to be having conversations with about your, uh, about with your, with your buyer. Okay. This is usually new to the buyer. So we want to explain every single line of the offer. We're not using acronyms, right? They don't get F, you know, for sale by owner, the FSBO, the, um, you know, KW, the gazillion acronyms that we use in our industry. So let's not use acronyms. We want to use language that they understand so that we are sure that they are clear. And when we're writing an offer, we now want to move quickly without rushing because when we rush, we miss something that's very important. You may only get one chance to put an offer in, especially in this market. If you are putting an offer in and it's going to be a multiple offer situation, you need to let your buyer know that, that you might only get one chance because some buyers could be used to the market the way it used to be where you put in an offer and then if there's multiple offers, the listing agent comes back and says, we're asking for highest and best. The seller does not have to go back and do that and give you another chance to put an offer in. So you need to make sure that your buyer is aware of that, okay? Know your contracts. And this is all kind of before we get into the actual checklist, you need to know the nitty gritties of your contracts, okay? so. Checklist for writing an offer. What are the price and terms? Consult with your buyer to arrive at the most logical offering based off of comps that you've pulled and with speaking with, with the lender on that property, okay? Seller's disclosures, read them. Read them with your buyer. <laughs> buyers are, you know, buyers are right now getting very hot to just put offers and put offers in because they don't wanna lose out. But if there's something within that seller's disclosure that was disclosed to you before you put that offer in, that's going to be a very big bad on you if that got missed. And they, they didn't, they're not reading that stuff line by line. We need to read it line by line and make sure that they know what is in that disclosure. Okay. Conveyances. You know, what's conveying with the property? What's going to transfer? Typically it's going to be, you know, your refrigerator and your stove and, you know, is it the washer and dryer? Is it the whole house generator? Is it not the generator? Let's not assume if they saw a generator there that it's going. Like we have to know and put in writing what our buyer is expecting and asking to be at the property. You know what always is a pain in the neck? The swing set. Is the seller assuming that the swing set is staying because they don't want to get rid of it? Is the buyer expecting it not to be there when they close? You need to have those conversations up front because the walkthrough is not the place to, to find that out. Okay? Maybe the buyer is expecting the swing set to be there, but the seller took it because it wasn't written into the contract. It's the personal property and what's being conveyed that can sometimes be such a pain in the neck at the final walkthrough. So let's be clear on what's conveying with the property. It's because you have to anticipate as a buyer's agent, <laughs> you have to be ahead of the game. You have to be looking at that property and understanding. So we had this happen many, many, many years ago. So in our contracts, we put in, when we submit everything, we ask for everything up front for the most part, unless they've already excluded it. Window shades, blinds, window treatments, fabrics, rods, blinds, shades, washer and dryer, any way you could describe all that stuff, we put it all in there because we had situations year, many, many years ago, we'd show up at a, at a, um, a walkthrough and everything stripped off the, with the windows. 
And I realize that there's certain things that could be considered fixtures as it relates to if they're screwed in based on how the contract reads and all that stuff. But I'm talking about like, there, there's some gray areas in there about the hanging fabric panels, you know, cause it may, maybe the rods got to stay, but the, you know, you got to put all that stuff in there. The swing set's a perfect example. Let's have the conversation about the snowblower right now. Maybe we need to do it on a separate addendum because the banks don't like to see that stuff, but you have to, you know, you have to ask this stuff because otherwise, guess what? You go to a, um, a walkthrough and there's that awkward moment when something's not there that maybe the buyer thought was going to be there. Guess what they do? They swing their neck and they look at you and you're supposed to have the answers. And guess who ends up buying window treatments or a washer or a dryer or this? You as the buyer's agent. So it's not fun. Absolutely. And you want to know what? We need to be giving our folks the best experience possible because this business is all about repeat and referral business. When we get to the, the final walkthrough, and, and this will be covered, I'm sure, in the contract to close um, session of Ignite, we want that walkthrough to be everything that the buyer is expecting it to be. Because when it's not, that's what they're going to remember. You will have done all of this work to get them to the closing table, get them under, find them, get them under, sh take them shopping, get them under agreement, get through the contract to close process. That could have all been done beautifully. You get to the final walkthrough and the swing set's not there. That's what they're going to remember. When that, someone says, how was your experience? Oh, I was really wanting that swing set for my four-year-old. I can't believe it wasn't there. That, all that work is out the window. We need to give them a great experience so that they want to refer us, so that they want to do business with us again. Because people buy multiple properties, right? They buy over, what, five to seven years. When are they going to next transact? You need to be there and you need to have given them a great experience. Um, so we're going to buzz through the rest of this check checklist and then we'll, I'll give you guys a break. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so, you know, earnest money. The buyer has to make a deposit and they need to understand that that earnest money goes back towards their costs at closing, right? But what is that, what is that deposit for? It's showing, it shows the seller good faith in the transaction it's, and it's gonna get deposited into an escrow account. We have to make sure the seller understands that they don't get that money. Some sellers will think, oh, how come I, where's the deposit? I, we went under contract, where's my five grand, okay? Um, and the buyer needs to understand that that is money that's going into the transaction. So it's going to go towards your, your closing costs and your financing at the end of the transaction. Um, in a competitive market, if there's multiple offers, the bigger the deposit, the, the more skin in the game, right? So you're going to want to have conversations with your buyer around that, but you don't want to risk their deposit. So we want, when we're writing the offer, we're, we're putting contingencies in there. They have to understand that if they're not doing inspections and they go and for some reason they get another, they get to go to the house again and they see something they want fixed and they want to pull out if it's not done, they don't get the money back. So they have to understand that earnest money is there. And if they pass a contingency to get that back, then game over. The money's gone. It goes to the seller. So, so we have the conversations around that. They also, you as a buyer's agent need to have a conversation about that earnest money deposit and where is it coming from the buyer? Is it liquid? Meaning do you have it sitting in a checking account? Could I have it today if I needed it? Or is it wrapped up in an IRA? Because you have to have the timeline as it relates to, you know, you're giving a thousand dollars with the offer, but you're giving an extra 15, you know, within two or three business days of, you know, you know a signed executed agreement. If, if you don't ask them, where is that money? They may say, oh, it's in an IRA. Well, how long is it going to take to clear that out? You know what I'm saying? Oh, it could take a week. All right, well, I got to write it in the contract so that I don't have the listing agent on top of me. So always ask them where that money is right now. Is it liquid? Is it cash? Is it in a checking account? Is it coming from someone? Is it wrapped up in an IRA or something that you have to liquid? You have to know that so that you can write those dates properly in there because otherwise you're gonna to have to do an addendum. You don't look professional. The buyer's all in a tizzy because they didn't understand that 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 stuff really happens on a regular basis. That the, Great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because not every buyer realizes that that deposit gets 
taken out of an account immediately. Yeah. So if you've only given yourself five days and it's going to take them longer to get that money and you're already under contract and I go in and put a backup offer on that, that's better than your offer. I'm getting that property for my guy. So you're risking your buyer losing that property if they can't deliver the earnest money on time. Okay. So thank you for bringing that up. Time for seller's acceptance. Be sure to specify the time for, express, for, for acceptance. You know, we don't want to leave offers lingering out there. And different states have different um, contracts. Some states write in a deadline, have to write in a deadline. Not every state does. Um, financing terms. Make sure that the financing terms would be agreeable to, um, to your buyer and the seller. Like VA, like FHA, like conventional. Um, if it's zero money down, Leslie, if you have a VA loan and it's zero money down, do you still put up earnest money? Yes, yes, yes. You can put in no earnest money, but the likelihood of your offer getting accepted is like, like teeny weeny itsy bitsy. Um, and I just put a VA buyer under that is putting 20% down. So if you have a VA buyer and they're using a VA loan because they earned the right to use that loan type, but they're not cash poor, that's something you need to communicate with your seller, right? Because you don't want a seller saying, I don't want a VA buyer because look at their cash poor. Anything goes wrong, they're not going to be able to afford the house. Um, so know I your loan type. So I'm so sorry. I have a quick question about the deadline that you spoke of. Yeah. Um, so I never had really heard of that entirely. And then I had, someone mentioned it, like another agent mentioned it recently I was like oh a deadline that seems rude in this market like are agents offended by that like you know when you're up against other want to be like well you have until Tuesday but is that yeah, a normalized I, is that a fairly normal thing I hate the offer deadline thing I'm not gonna right, lie we are right. we are in that market right now where I'm gonna just keep it open for a week and then have a deadline in a week yeah um, okay I'm not so, crazy with that. I'm saying, you know, if you're writing the offer, the wrong offer maybe. Yeah, if, if from the writing the offer perspective, you can mm -hmm. put a deadline in there for when you need to hear back from the seller. But if you are going to do that, use language that isn't aggressive. Right. Because you know, if you're like this offer expires in 24 hours, that's very aggressive language, and that's not creating a win-win situation. Okay. Um, it's not setting the tone. If you are needing a response back, it could be buyer respectfully requests a response back by this date this okay, time right and right. then it's again it's a conversation right yeah it's not it just might writing be, it like, in there right and it might be because we have needs to put in other offers or something to that effect or we know that we have a fairly strong offer that you don't need to dilly dally on all right yeah because my instinct said it feels rude but i suppose the language yeah. is everything the, right, link, you. the link. Yeah, you're very welcome. And you know, your buyer might be going out of town, like you might need a response, because if they're going to go under, you have to have documentation signed up, right? I think it's also I think it also depends on what your offer is. I, I agree with the language, right? The buyer kindly requests a response. Um, I've also had situations where if I'm stepping forward with my buyer with a really strong, clean, you know, deal and I'm trying to take this off the market, you know, before this, you know, I'm not going into the weekend. Like this is it. I'm giving you a strong offer that's clean and I want an offer by five o'clock. You could still be respectful and professional about it. However, you need to convey that to the listing agent that you, you, you're making this under the idea that I'm not going to be shopped all weekend with my offer, you know, for, for, for other buyers to come in. So there are times to be professionally aggressive, I guess is the best way I yeah. can. And that's when you know you are going for the death blow. You are going to take this out and you are trying to get this out and you are trying to represent your client the best way you can. So just keep that in mind. There are times to be professionally aggressive, but you have to do it in the right way. Yep. And, that, I and so the, that, yeah. And, and I think that's where the agent had said it when I was when it was introduced to me, that was kind of how it was presented. So I appreciate that outlook. Absolutely. And some, you know, you don't necessarily do that with every offer. This is a toolkit, right? Sometimes you pull different tools out for different offers. Okay. Um, you know, we're having the pre-approval letter that has the, the at property address. It has the right dollar amount on it. If they're fully a, a, approved with your lender, even better. 
um, really know what that what that loan what the pre approval looks like. The closing date you have to put that into the offer. We want a closing date that will work for the buyer, for the seller, and for the lender. Okay. Um, a home warranty. We don't really see a lot of home warranties in this market, but they could come back around. Um, it's a tool that it, you can put a home warranty into a contract and have the seller um, purchase a home warranty for the buyer. That's a, it's a tool. We'll probably see that come back around when we get back into a buyer's market. Um, repair limits. Focus on the items the buyer is most interested in repairing. We're not seeing that a lot right now either. But if there's something that has to be repaired on the property that you need for maybe the loan type or just that's a requirement from your buyer, then that may get written into a contract. What are the other special clauses or contingencies that, that have to be met that are going to be put in writing, like a satisfactory inspection or the buyer obtaining specific financing? Um, we're seeing appraisal gap contingencies right now, right? So what, what are those contingencies? If you're have a contingency that you need to write into a contract, please talk to your leadership before you just willy nilly write contingencies, because there is a lot of compliance around contingencies that are not organic to the contract. Um, Leslie, was that your quick question? Um, no, so I just wanted to just touch on the VA loan again, because I have a buyer that has a VA loan. So I'm just confused. I, she was saying like, oh, yeah, we don't have to put money down. But so when you're putting earnest money down, where does it does it just come off the list price if they do accept, like in the end, say she puts 5,000 down? Like no, they'll, money, still have, no? they'll still have closing costs um, and prepaids. Like prepaids are like taxes, you know, because people pay taxes ahead and behind when you make a tax payment. So there right. are closing costs that happen. And if for some weird reason they put, you know, an earnest money down that exceeded what their costs were going to be, they'd get a check back at closing. Okay. Good to know. All right. That's thank you. Really, that's a really good point from someone who handles on the listing side. Buyers, agents, and buyers need to understand there is a difference between what are you putting down for financing in terms of a in terms of you know your whether you're putting five percent, three percent, twenty percent, and your good faith deposit, your earnest money, right? In Rhode Island typical it's it's not it doesn't have to be but it's typically five percent gets held in you know as earnest money so then your question is all right well i've got someone doing fha or va they're putting down three percent or or nope nothing right so a lot of times the agent will say well what, what they're doing 100 percent financing why are they going to put down any earnest money well on the listing side i'm representing my seller i'm not taking this off the market for no money or for 100 bucks what's keeping them what's keeping them close to the deal so it's nice to have a situation where if they're doing FHA or if they're doing VA and they're not putting down much, and that's fine in terms of their financing, that it's nice to be able to say that they're going to put down maybe 5,000 or 10,000 towards a deal towards earnest money, because it helps the seller feel more comfortable about taking it off the market. So you have to be able to explain that to your buyer because the buyer is going to look at you and say, why the heck am I putting anything? Why am I, why am I giving you any money right now? I don't, I don't get it. I, I'm doing hundred percent financing. So in this market, especially though, when you're competing, you want to does, put them in a situation to, to succeed. Um, quick other question too. Does it like, um, does it matter to the seller what kind of loan you're using? Like, would they be like, oh, a VA as opposed to a conventional? Would they be like, mm, I'm going to go with the conventional? Depends. Well, this is where you have to sell, you have, right? It can. So you have to sell the VA to, you have to, I would assume that it does and then sell that to, the listing agent. That's that phone call. We are going to be, we're using a VA loan because I have a, a, a proud patriot who served in the Marines and they want to be able to use that loan. They're not cash poor. They are putting an earnest money deposit down. Okay. And so you need to sell that to the listing right. agent. And remember, we're giving them the language that we want them to go back to the seller with. Right. The FHA becomes an issue, uh, I guess, Leslie, to, to your point, it definitely can be a factor, especially if you're competing against other offers, right? If you've got cash offers or you know conventional financing, is FHA, um, 
you know, considered a lesser loan. It's not, but it's just got more hoops to run through. And it's just not as, you know, especially on the appraisal piece, right? And if you got chipping pain or a, a property that needs some work, FHA sometimes can be a, an absolute nightmare for, for the appraisal piece. So it really depends on the property, but it is sad because I do believe that there are many listing agents out there that when they say at, when they see FHA or VA, they're like, ugh, you know, and that's a disservice to the buyer community because not everybody has cash to put down for conventional financing or cash to put down, you know, to, to close the deal. So yeah. it, it's hard, but it can't work against you. You, you have to, you know, Susan said, you have to sell it. Yeah. Is that it, something I should explain to my buyer when they are like, you know, cause my, my, my buyer, Deb, she just got into a relationship with her boyfriend. So now he's doing the loan. So she went from conventional to VA and she's like, oh, we don't have to put money down. And so should I explain to her like, oh, that's great. But also you have to like understand yeah. with this market, like it's like, how would I explain that? Like when she's not getting her offers accepted because of that? Well, I would explain it just like Connor had had talked about and then also ta have a conversation with them about putting a bigger earnest money deposit okay. down even if they have to get that back and then mm -hmm. talk to them about making sure they're fully pre-approved with their lender because if they've gotten all of their paperwork to their lender their files already gone to the underwriter and you can sell that to the selling aid the listing agent then that will give you a, a, a more leeway for getting a va or an fha offer accepted okay Okay. Thank the, you. You're welcome. The last item on the checklist is cover letters, which we're going to cover um, in a few slides down. So I'm going to stop here and we can take a quick break. Um, it's 1026. So does 1035 work for everybody? 1035. We will see you back at that time.
Okay, we'll, okay, we'll wait for wait some for folks to get folks to get back back. But hey, I have a but question hey, for, have you a guys. for you guys. Who's um, feed, who's feed, um, yeah feed, yeah feedback feedback yeah. I don't know. Is that me? Well, it wasn't happening before, so I'm not. I sure know. I don't know what's yeah. going on. You fixed it though. It's I don't hear it anymore. How's that? We're back. It's perfect. Will my headset work? Yeah. Okay. Just selling smalls. <laughs> so I've sold one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What are you buying there, Rebecca? She's selling small, she said. Ten more oh. items. Cool. <laughs> Averaging. Probably. If they have it in my color, I'd like a double extra small. Right? In the other direction. I don't think <laughs> we're talking to her. Or the I don't think conversation. so. <laughs> um, so, hey, I have a quick question. Are you guys setting appointments? Our goal for Ignite, right, was and for Spark was to set two appointments. How are you guys doing with that? Bucks. Susan, if you want to make me a co-host, I can, she just muted herself. Perfect. I, I just muted her. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to make you a co-host. <laughs> yeah. How's your side hustle? Oh. I'm so <laughs> well, She meant studio apartments, but I think she's talking about <laughs> or something. But anyway, who knows? All right. No one's jumping on to tell me they made some, set some appointments, but I'm, so I'm going to kind of remind you guys again that the whole uh, the goals for Ignite are to be setting two appointments. So if you haven't set those appointments yet, um, when you get off of Ignite today, that's your goal. Get on the phone, get some appointments, even if they're appointments with people in your sphere that you can just talk to about real estate. Let them know that that's what you're doing. I'd just love to have a conversation with you about, about real estate and my new career. Or, the, you know- The unsolicited you, CMA, right? Yeah. Actually, I've got the paperwork from uh, uh, great coach Mark Richard for his real estate checkup script. Uh, I will drop that in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. To Susan's point, like honestly, the, the stickiness of our industry is when we can get people to, to kitchen tables and conference tables and get that first document signed. And, yep. if, and, if you're, and if you don't have any appointments right now, but you can look back since the top of the month and say, well, I haven't really been doing the activities. Um, well, then we've, we've got the gap now. Now we know that if we just need to lift that 40,000 pound phone to our face and talk to the humans. And to Susan's point too, just if even if you're sitting with a friend like, hey, I'm getting started. If you and Steve would like to know where you stand in the marketplace, I'd love to do a CMA, then get together with you on Zoom or on your deck or in your house, if you're okay with that uh, tomorrow at four, Friday at five. Um, would it be okay for you to find out where you stand in the currently in the market? Even if they're not thinking about selling, because if you bring that value to them, now they know what you're capable of doing and they can start to tell their friends about the opportunity. They can, it, they're going to drop it into conversation over the weekend. Like, yep. yeah, our equity went up $75,000 or probably, probably more than that in the current market, uh, maybe more than that. And then they can start to share with their friends the opportunity that might be available to them. Yep. I have it, just something to share. Sure. So yesterday when I was uh, to the bakery, uh, right, I just met someone that, uh, and he just started a conversation and then he asked me for my car. Um, but he, he told me he's not ready to buy a house yet, but he wants to do it in the future. So he just gave me his n number, his name, but I don't know how to do it again. You know, if, should I call today? Should I text? What, what should I do next? Because I want him to continue to remind me. Yes. So you remember me. Yeah, great question. And you need to be reaching out to him regularly so that he's always reminded that you're in real estate. And remember the Ford script, you call them and you talk about family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. And I know you were on that last call that I, that uh, training session I did, remember the wave? There's a wave where you ask people questions about their life so that you can plot on the wave when they last bought, what are life events happening that you can now plot when they're gonna be back up and ready to start purchasing again. So you're going to put I them tried. in command. Yeah, I you're did it a little bit yesterday. So 
uh, he explained that he, is, he wants to buy, so he, but for a lower price, so he can fix in for him to live, yeah. I guess, with his family. Uh, but I, I guess he's living in the house, but he is not his house. Yeah, that I wasn't sure, but that, that's what I thought. That he Personally, I would set him up on through your MLS to be receiving properties that are in the parameters with what he's looking at. And then I'd call him every three to four weeks to check in with him so that you're reminding him with value that you're there for him and ask if he's been looking at the properties, ask about any of the Ford scripts, just something that you're in communication with him so that when you hear that his motivation is changing, that you're there for him. The thing is, he, he, I asked for his email. He didn't give me his email. I guess he doesn't have it. I don't know if he doesn't know how to use it or he actually doesn't have an email. I don't know. Yeah. So Just keep that, working it. You just got to keep calling and keep working and asking those questions and adding value until you yeah. get it. You know, it'll happen. All right. Thank you. It, it will happen. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, I'm not going to open up command this, uh, you know, when we are writing offers, we do put this information in command. Um, your office, most at most market centers have a tech person or a tech direct director or somebody that can walk you through creating an opportunity in command for um, once you get to the point of you're writing an offer, you should be creating opportunities. Um, so I'm going to put that back on you guys offline because we're going to jump ahead to offer writing, which is super fun. And there are guidelines for offering, for writing offers. You have the checklist that we just went over um, before break, and that is in your, your toolkit. I would take that out. You may wanna add components to writing an offer checklist for your own personal checklist and so that you have them. And you wanna take that out when you are writing an offer. And there are going to be different guidelines that might change from state to state. So I don't wanna get into anything state specific. And one of the things that we're gonna move into talking about was the end of the last line of the checklist, which was a cover letter, okay? So we're gonna talk about this a, a little bit. We should be writing cover letters to submit with our offers. That is my best practice. I do send a cover letter in the body of an email to the co-broke. And we're not, we used to do like buyer love letters to go to the sellers. We're not doing those anymore. There's a lot of federal fair housing guidelines that we want to avoid breaking, but it is good to send a letter to the, the, the listing agent. So if we're submitting an offer, I'm sending a letter to them. Um, I just have a question on that. So the agent sends a letter as well, because I had my buyers sent offer letters. So there's a lot of federal, I, I would encourage you to ask your market center to have some training around federal fair housing. It's really putting the sellers in a risky position to be receiving any buyer love letters because, you know, we're in that climate of, you know, someone's gender, someone's the race, religion. We don't want sellers accepting offers that could be construed as I'm accepting an offer based off of somebody's race, religion, or some other um, federally protected category. Yes, my mom. Or, or you know, not accepting yeah, an I, offer I think it's, I think it's for that scenario. Right, right. I think I think that, that, that's a good point, too, because my buyer, he's from minority group. You know, because my son also Sticky. bought, yeah. So my son also bought through Keller Williams and he submitted um, an offer letter with the picture of himself. Yeah. Over dark skin. We and used to do it. We used to do that all the time, but we really shouldn't be doing that anymore um, because it. we're just in the climate where that could be against, you could be putting someone. So that whole piece of the running your business and compliance and risk management Right. That's where this falls into play. We don't want to be putting buyers and sellers in situations where they could be breaking federal fair housing regulation. And they don't know that. So we need to educate them on that. Perfect. Okay? Good point. But you yeah. know what a great transition is? Send a love letter to the, the Cobro about how great you are going to be to work with. Right. right. So my Cobro love letters sound a little bit like um, 
you know, hey, Tim, Susan Kenyon here. So happy to be submitting an offer to you. A few things I'd like to bring up. I'm a, I'm a seasoned agent, or you may not be able to say that, but you may be able to say, you know, you're on a team of whatever. Um, and first and foremost, I am somebody that believes in a win-win for every transaction. I'm a great co-broke to work with. I have set great expectations with my buyers. If you're doing inspections, then I say something like, I have set realistic expectations with my buyers in regards to the home inspection process. They have a full understanding that we're really only looking for a significant issue that hasn't been disclosed. We will not be coming back to your seller with a small honeydew list of like replacing electric outlet covers. So we're doing those things. We might bring up other components that are important. Like I might say, you know, I'm happy to let you know my buyer is fully pre-approved with a great local lender that I do a lot of business with. What I mean by that is their file has already gone through underwriting. So from a finance risk category, my buyer is looking very, very strong to be submitting this offer. So whatever points that you can pull out to be, to again, we're giving this listing agent something we want them to go back to the seller with. And okay. I'm going to be a great co-broke to work with. But can we say anything about the buyer, the potential buyer, not mentioning the last name because that gives it away? Well, like they're going to I... see the last name on the offer anyway, because it has buyer's oh, names right, on right, that. Right. Yeah, but yeah, what you're exactly. selling here, what you're selling are terms in the contract, how great you are to work with, how solid the financing is, that you've set expectations around contingencies that you might be built into the contract. Nowhere in there am I referencing anything that is uh, protected under federal fair housing, race, religion, and shame on me, I don't remember every single category on that. But, um, you know, we're not referencing well, those personal pieces. Yeah. We're referencing how solid of a contract offer it is, the good components of their financing, how great you're going to be um, to work with. So that's what I send the co-broke, Lourdes, and that's Lourdes, we're specifically talking about co-broke love letter, co-broke cover letters, um, for sure. That is what you're sending to the co-broke. And, and here it says, dear seller's names. I'm going to say my best practice is to put, you know, dear Tim, who send this to the let to the um, the co-broke. Okay. Okay. So this, this probably could be updated with um, the Ignite materials to change this from being something that you send to the, directly to the seller to being something that you send directly to the co-broke. Okay. Um, I focus on uh, how me and the buyer will be great to work with, that we've set the right expectations. Um, and that we really want a win-win situation. Because you know what, nobody, nobody likes, it's not a great transaction when only one side gets everything and the other side doesn't get and doesn't get anything. We need give me's on both sides of it, of the transaction. Because when we go into this, we might think that we're not going to need to ask something of the other side. So from a buyer perspective, we're going to submit an offer. But somewhere down the line, we might need to be coming back to that seller and asking for an extension on something, an extension on a home inspection, an extension on finance commitment. Um, there could be some contingency in there that we're going to need an extension on closing. So we need to create a win-win right from the get-go so that as we're moving through this contract to close process, we have a good working relationship. And, and, that, and that ask that you might have to do later down the line is going to be more likely to be received with a yes. So we're setting the time, we're setting the, the mood for this contract right from the beginning, okay? Um, it's common for buyers. So we're gonna talk about some buyer offer objections, okay? It's common for buyers to wanna request that the seller maybe um, does things to the property. You know, maybe they're gonna request the seller to make repairs in the offer. They might wanna do that. So the objection handler, um, handling those obje objections upfront and uncovering them are going to be really important. We want as few objections going into this as possible. And 
I think the best advice on how to do that is the advice that Connor gave us all at the very beginning of today's session on setting expectations. Okay, so when we're educating that buyer right from the beginning on what the offer process looks like, when it's time to make the offer and then they want to ask for all these repairs to be done for whatever reason, we're not having to start from ground zero on this is what the climate in the market looks like right now. The more you're asking for in a contract, the less likely you are of getting um, under contract, right? They may have to lose some properties before they get under contract. And that happens a lot right now too, right? They go into it wanting to have a lot of contingencies put into an offer, and then they're up against other offers that don't have the contingencies and they're getting told no, it's gonna loosen up and re, then now you can reset some expectations for what your next offers are going to look like, okay? Everyone has a client that expects a deal on everything. It's very hard right now to get a buyer under contract when they expect a deal. That doesn't mean there aren't properties out there that have been sitting on the market that are overpriced that you can get a deal on. It just means that it's a little less likelihood of a scenario right now. So you have to do your homework, right? How long, what are the days on market on that property? What are the comps on that property? Did I ask all the right questions from the listing agent about the seller to know whether or not I have any ability to build those things in for my buyer, okay? And we use facts when we're handling buyer's objections, our own buyer's objections on how to write the best and offer and be the strongest buyer. We have to overcome their objections. So we use facts to do that, not, well, I'm Susan Kenyon, so I think that you should go in at this price, okay? It looks more like these are the days on market. These are the closed comps. Go back to their motivation, right? Homes that are three bedroom, two bathroom in this town, in this price range, the days on market are like four or five. They go under very quickly. So if your buyer's objection, if your buyer wants to lowball, the likelihood in that scenario of them winning that contract is very, very small. So when we go to them with facts, it takes it off of, well, Susan just wants me to overpay so that I, she can get a commission. And it puts it onto the actual facts of our marketplace. And it's showing off how professional you are. Okay. Does anyone have any thoughts around that or questions? We do work, sometimes we're gonna work with buyers that are, will just, you know, they're gonna to wanna to do everything that you suggest to them. And in that scenario, it's also important to be making your suggestions based on facts. Because remember, when something goes wrong in a real estate transaction, it's always the agent's fault. So we don't want buyers overpaying if, for properties, right? Unless they are aware that this is the closed comp and they want, it's very competitive, they know that, they wanna go in over asking, we've given them the facts around that and they've made the decision. And we document all of this stuff, especially in this environment. If we are having buyers putting in offers that are over and we've run comps from them, I save those comps a lot of the time in my dot loop or in your opportunity and command. You can save that documentation so that you have a record of what you have consulted with them on. And you can put those comments in your in command or in your database so that you have that to go back to. Because when it's a problem, they, you will get a phone call, okay? So we're going to move into presenting the offer, right? Because we're talking about making and receiving offers. So that means we've got to present the offer. And that looks like notifying the listing agent of an incoming offer, which we've talked about, right? We call them. This is Susan Kenyon. I loved, my buyers loved the property at 123 Main Street. We are going to be submitting an offer. You had the conversation on what's important to the seller. We're also letting them know that it's coming. And please don't be that person that calls me as the listing agent on Sunday at five o'clock when I'm having dinner with my family. Okay, let's be respectful of other agents' time. That's how we have good co-broke relationships. Okay, 
So we let them know it's coming. We also let them know because if it's a Saturday or a Sunday or at night, I might not be stocking my email looking for offers that come in. So if you call me and tell me it's coming in, I'll know to be looking for it. Okay. We're going to write that cover letter to that, to that buyer's date, to that listing agent, and we're going to send the offer to the agent. We're going to ask politely for a deadline. Maybe, maybe not. That's a you can or you, don't, you, you may or you may not set the deadline. But if we are doing it, we're using language that is not offensive or aggressive. aggressive. Okay. My buyer respectfully requests a response by blah, 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 and give them time. Give them time to give the agent time to get the offer, prepare it, send it over to their seller, and time for them to review it. So if I'm submitting it at five o'clock at night and I want a response by noon the next morning, the next day, I'm not really giving people enough time to actually have a life, like eat dinner, maybe they're working. So you need to ask those questions. I'm sending over an offer. My, my folks are gonna be requesting a response by this time. Will you be able to connect with your seller in time for that? Okay. And then you're gonna create your offer in command. Okay, you're going to create an opportunity and put it in command or create an opportunity in when you are in command. <laughs> okay, and then we're going to set the expectation with the buyer, right? So notifying the listing agent, pick up the phone, you know, call or text or get some kind of confirmation back that they've received the offer. We're letting them know, I'm calling them to let them know the offer's coming in so they're looking for it. And then I'm gonna be asking them to confirm when they've received it. I might be asking when they think that we'll have a response by. So now I can let my buyers know what the expectation is. Because if, if I'm submitting it at five o'clock, they could be sitting on pins and needles on their couch, binge watching, TV, waiting to hear back from you, thinking that you're going to get back to them that night. So if it's not going to be till the next day, or most likely not, let them know that so that they can get on with their day and they're not having anxiety waiting for a response. Because there's a lot of emotions involved, right? I made the offer. Do they have it? Do they have it? Do you think they liked it? How well do you think it was received? Were there other offers? So you need to have that kind of information to keep your buyer's um, in check with the right expectation of when they're going to hear back. Okay. So I'm not going to get into the role playing with the presenting offers. I think we did talk about that a lot. Does it, unless anyone has a question on how I present it, um, then you can let me know when I am presenting it, if there is a nuance to the contract, and by that, I mean maybe a contingency, maybe a date that seems a little too fast or too long. I'm calling, I'm having a conversation, I'm letting the co-broke know that that's, I, I wrote it that way for a reason. And if they can deliver that reason back to the seller, it prevents someone from getting the wrong impression or tone about an offer. Okay. You know, but there are two sides to this, right? We have the buyer side and the seller side. So when we're representing the seller, we move to rep, um, we move we move to receiving an offer. Okay, so that looks like gathering information about that we receive the offer, and we need to gather information about the buyer, right? So maybe I have, there are agents out there, there's buyer agents out there that are going to, maybe they, their, buy, their buyer went to the open house, so they never even saw the property. They never contacted the listing agent to find out about the seller. They wrote an offer, they emailed it over and never called. Like that happens in real life. So we as a listing agent, we need to now go back and get information about the buyer right? Do they have a home to sell? Are they pre-approved? Okay. Do we have all of the signed documents? Like, did they give me back the signed disclosures? Um, did they send a copy of the earnest money deposit? Do I have their pre-approval? Does it equal at minimum of the purchase price? What do I know about that lender? Have I ever heard of them? 
Is it Bank of America? You know, <laughs> is it Quicken? Is it a local lender that I've heard of before that's going to be great to work with? Okay. Did we call the lender? So if this is an offer that comes in and this is going to be a viable candidate for my seller, I'm calling the lender myself and getting some information about that buyer. Not every agent is going to put in there that there's a home sale contingency, which really irks me. If they have to sell that home in order to make that purchase, the seller has the right to know about that. But not there's many an agent who does not put that into the contract. And you find out from the lender at like finance commitment time that this commitment is pending the, the, the buyer receiving funds from the sale of their home at 123 Main Street. That is not the time to be finding out that this deal is contingent on them selling something. So we have to ask, does yeah. your buyer have to sell a home in order to purchase this one? That's what happened to me yesterday. Um, the, the closing date is much closer than we expected because of that fact. And that wasn't in the listing agreement. Yeah. Yep. It's got to ask the right questions, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. And then we're going to, after we gather that information about the buyer, we're going to present the offer to our client right? And we do, this is important stuff. So when we receive the offer, we submit that and present that to the, to the client. When I receive an offer from a buyer for a seller, I get on the phone or in person and I go over that offer line by line because we know what that seller's doing, right? They're going right to purchase price. There could be other things within that contract contingencies that would impact how favorable this offer is. When's the closing date? How much money are they putting down? Is there a home inspection? Is there other due diligence ex in inspections? What is happening within that contract? Are they asking for the hot tub? They might not have gotten that far in the contract and they just went to purchase price and they have no intention of leaving that hot tub there. Or is it we back to the swing set? You know, what, is, what are they asking to convey? What is the buyer asking that seller to leave behind? So we need to present that to, um, to our seller and we need to go over every line of that contract with them of what, what is being offered. It's not always about the price, okay? And you're gonna let them know that, you know, what is up with the, the lending in that? So let's talk about how we review that offer is that in here? Do I have that checklist? Um, so is the offer like well-written, right? That's super important. And some agents are rushing. They're moving too quickly. They may have, this might be the fourth offer they've written for their buyer. So there might be stuff in there that's not correct that might have been from a previous offer. Do they have the address of the property right? Do they have the name of your seller right? Right? The name of your seller should be whatever is written on that deed. So if it's held in trust, the seller is a trust. If it's only in the husband's name and not the wife's name, the wife should not be as listed as a seller. Like we need to be aware of how uh, of what the that the names are correct for your side of the transaction. Does the seller, does the buyer's name and information match what the pre-approval information is? Okay. What's the price? Check to see whether the offer falls in the range of the seller's expectations. How much of an earnest money are they putting down? Is there a, is there a deadline for me to accept or to respond for the seller with the seller? Do I have their pre-approval? Do I have their financing terms and are they suitable to the property, right? Is this an FHA buyer and, and my seller's home is like, has some issues that will not pass FHA? Is my seller willing to make any corrections to the property to accommodate for an FHA buyer? Does that have to happen? Are they even able to do that? Those are the things that we're looking at for financing. Is the closing date agreeable? You know, is it a holiday? 
Is it a weekend? Okay. And we're going to ask questions about the buyer, like how long have they been looking? If they're out of town, if they're from out of town, you know, we can ask questions that maybe, you know, this, that might lead to their motivation. And we need to do that so that we know how to advise our client on how to respond. You know, if I say, hey, Lourdes, where are your folks from? Why are they moving to the area? And she says, they are, they have got to get under agreement because their kids are supposed to start school in two weeks and they don't have any place to live. Oh, great. That's good information for me as a listing agent to know because I know her motivation is now a lot higher to get under contract with this property. And I might be able to recommend a counter offer based on uh, with price or something more favorable to my seller because now I know her motivation is very high. Okay. Have they made offers on other properties? It doesn't, they don't have to answer those questions, but it doesn't hurt to ask them. There's plenty of agents out there that will tell you anything. We'll give you, we'll answer any question, whether they should or not. Our job is to represent the seller in this situation. Okay. So presenting the offer, we need to notify the seller, right? Present the offer in person if you can, or over the phone is I'm, I'm perfectly fine with, you know, I have some clients that I have to go to their house to present offers. And I can't take, somebody's at my door, but I can't take it. Um, so present the offer in person if possible. Like if I have an older couple and they're not good, oh my gosh, I apologize. I have to just get, get this guy off my doorstep or my dog will not stop barking. I apologize for that. Um, <laughs> so we need to back up here because I now have skipped a slide. Okay, so we're, um, if we have to present in person, we, we do present in person. Over the phone works well too. I just like to make sure that your seller has the contract up when you're reviewing the offer, okay? That's another um, interesting point. And, and like I said, it doesn't happen as much now, um, but obviously when the market shifts back to, you know, a little bit more of an equal market is when there are certain sellers, if they're not in town, they're not in town, right? I, I just, I can't get in front of them, but there are certain sellers that I can maybe have a conversation with. And there are going to be other sellers that, you know what, we've been on the market three months. I need to get in front of them. I need to see their eyes. I need to, I need to read their body language. Like I need to give get the best chance to get a good response. Cause right. You, you respond, you send over an offer. If you just throw it over, what's their initial re response going to be? No, just tell it's, it's too low. Forget it. You know what I'm saying? Uh -uh. I need to get with them. I need to be face to face. I need to use my scripts. We need to have a conversation. It's going to give us, cause otherwise I know what the answer is going to be. That's more in a traditional market, but keep in mind, I think the best chance you have is to get in front of your clients if they're local. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we're in the relationship business and it's easier, you know, body language is important and tonality is important. So we need to, you know, put our best foot forward here when we're presenting the offer. This is a really big deal. They're going to want to jump to the purchase price really quickly. They're going to forget that they might have other components to the offer that are important to them, like timelines for their family. What's their motivation? If this is a lower offer, and, you know, you've told me that you want to get your family to Florida so that you can be with the grandkids when they start school. How would your life look if we were able to make this deal work? I would like to get you to Florida. Go back to their motivation. If this is not the most ideal offer, but it's the one that you have, and if it's the only one you have, then you go back to a seller's motivation to walk them through how do we move forward? Because remember, 
the seller has three options, right? They can accept it, they can counter it, or they can reject it. Okay. So when they're looking through, you know, the price, you're going to need to do a net sheet with them. So the price is the price, but what are the expenses involved? What are they going to be walking away from the closing table with? That's what they really need to know. So if there's like, we don't do much for, fine, for seller concessions right now, but we're going to talk about it because we will go back to that market. Is the buyer asking for the seller to contribute towards closing costs? But they didn't get that far down into the, uh, con the offer to read that part. We're going to run through a net sheet with them. Are there any state taxes involved? How much is the commission? What are their closing costs going to be? Give them an idea. You should be able to get really close with the seller. Do they, what's their payoff? you should get be able to get very, very close with the seller to what their check's gonna look like when they leave the closing table, okay? I'm not gonna do a net sheet with you here today, but if you don't have one, go to your leadership and ask your coach or whoever you work with to walk you through that because that is, the net to the seller is really important, okay? I use a net sheet. So this is the same thing when we were talking about setting expectations for our buyer. We, we're setting these expectations with our seller right from the get-go too. So I pull out a net sheet when I first start talking to a seller so that they understand when we're talking about what where we're going to list a house, where we're going to list a property, what their actual bottom line is going to look like. Okay. Um, we The co-broke, if they, <laughs> this is the thing too, like when we talk about our co-broke relationships, there's co-brokes out there that are snarky. They, they just are. It doesn't matter. We need to, our job is to sell the house for our seller. Our job is to get them where they want it to go. So if someone's presenting you an offer for your seller and they're just kind of not being at the professional level that, that you would like for them to be at, take a deep breath, let it go, and do not pass that on to your seller. They don't deserve that. What they deserve is to get the best price for their house and the best timeline that works for them. So we don't pass any of that on to our seller. We take it, we can vent about it for two minutes to ourselves and then we just move on and we present the offer and we let all of the rest of that go, okay? We run comps again, right? Did the market change? So we'll put the offer into perspective. Is this offer so far over asking price that it's never going to appraise? Then I need to investigate with that buyer, do they have the money to cover an appraisal gap? No? Well, what are we going to do when it appraises low? We have to prepare our seller for that. Or maybe you're redoing a CMA and the market's dropped. Maybe the market's increased. We won't know that until we redo comps. Okay. And when I say update the CMA, again, this doesn't have to be a super long CMA involved process. It's you're really running comparables. Okay. I don't even use a really fancy CMA on my listing presentation. I do it all based on facts and comps and pictures of closed comps or active comps. Okay. We're going to present the offer. We're going to go over the price. Are the, is the buyer asking for any repairs? We're going to let them know if we've uncovered any buyer motivation, right? Because we've asked the buyer's agent questions about the buyer. And we need to let our seller know that. What is their buyer? If we know that they are desperate to move into this neighborhood, yeah, we need to tell our seller that because that can play a role in how they're going to counter offer. What are the other contingencies? Remember, it's not always about price. Is there inspections? Are there repairs? Are there financing contingencies? Is there a contingency on, um, you know, the buyer has a home to sell? What are those contingencies looking like? Okay. And then again, we let the seller know what their options are. They can counter, they can accept, or they can reject. And Mr. Seller, if you counter, these are, you can counter on anything in the contract. 
I mean, you might have suggestions around that, okay? If there are contingencies, you might wanna cut down the, dead, the dates on those contingencies. If they're asking for 14 days, you might wanna counter at seven. And then you're gonna give them a chance to respond, have that conversation with you. And then you go back to the buyer's agent with whatever has been decided. Okay, but presenting the offer is, um, it should be timely. If there's more than one decision maker there, they should both be present while you're, while you're reviewing the offer. If that's, at all, if, it, if that's possible, you should really push for that. When's a good time for me to get both Mr. and Mrs. on the phone or in person to review the offer? The wife is usually their decision maker. Now, sorry to sound sexist there, but the wife has to be on board on that. Oh, that's another, that's another point. Um, you gotta be, you gotta be real careful about insinuating. I mean, if you've got two decision makers, you know, husband and wife, then it sounds obvious, but how would you not want to have them both present? But I will tell you, it's less concerning when you're under contract, but you can, in, in this world, in this climate, social climate that we're in, you can offend people real quick. I'll give you an example. I gotta be careful if Susan, if I'm talking with Susan right now and it's her and her husband who are making a decision, I've gotta be real careful about asking for her husband to be present for all this stuff because she may take it as what I, you know, you, you, I'm not good enough or, you know, th that kind of thing. I had it happen more on the listing side and it wasn't intentional. The property was in both their names. I met with the wife first. We had a good meeting. However, another agent came in and, and had a higher price. So I didn't meet the husband, but I thought, you know what? Hey, let me redo my numbers and let's try to meet again. And the husband was on title and I made a statement and I said, you know what? Happy to get together again in a couple of weeks when you get back from your vacation. Let me rerun some numbers. And you know what? Maybe it's an opportunity for me to meet with your husband as well. And she goes, oh, that, that sounds like a good idea, right? I mean, it was very innocent. I was not so I called a couple of weeks later when I was ready, when they were back from their vacation, she sent me a, she sent me a text after and she said, I was really taken aback by your comment about having to meet with my husband too. Therefore, I don't want to continue talking with you. Yeah. Yeah. That happens a lot. Um, that was a good point to bring up Connor, because that, that definitely happens. I, and I had that too, where um, I had a husband agree to, to want to do a, a home ins a pre home inspection before listing, and then the wife later was so mad that that had happened, and said, "Well, you should have off you should have asked us if we wanted to do that before you just did it." I'm like, "Do I throw the husband under the bus right now and let her know that he did okay that?" But yeah, when there are important decisions to make, you got to nicely find a way to get, yeah. if at all possible, both parties on board on that. Um. So we're presenting the offer there, and then we are going to have to respond to the offer. We need to reach a decision, right? So counter, accept, reject. If they're accepting the offer, as is, we move to get signatures right away. Let, if, if we're ready to go, then time is of the essence. We get signatures, and we send that back to the co-broke so that you can get under agreement, okay? The, the seller here doesn't have to go back for highest and best. They might like the offer just the way it is. They might be mul multiple offers and they might wanna go back for highest and best. A lot of sellers don't like doing that because it's stressful for them. If they have some good selections of offers, it might create more stress for them to go back and ask for highest and best. They might just want to pick one and move forward with it. Okay. Um, 
when there are multiple offers, if your seller has given you permission to disclose that, then you can let the buyer agents know that we have multiple offers because we want to encourage them to put their best offer forward first, knowing that they might not have a chance to put another one in. It so stinks when your buyer, the buyer doesn't put their best offer in and they come back and say, oh, I would have, I would have offered 10 more. Why didn't you tell me that when I was writing the offer? <laughs> you know, they just don't, sometimes they have to go through the pain of losing some things before they, before they get under contract. But didn't um, you say earlier that the buyer could put in another offer? I after? have. So. so yes, absolutely. So maybe we go, maybe we have just this one offer right. on the table and the seller rejects it and you can't get the seller to counter. You can invite that buyer's agent to come back with a stronger offer and let them know that you'll present it. The key here is that when we are presenting, we're doing it very professionally, right? Because if we pass tone and negativity about that buyer with the first time they put an offer in to the seller, and then they come back with a much stronger offer, they're tainted. The seller's already doesn't like that buyer. And you know what? Okay. People... Buyers and sellers walk away from deals based on principle all the time. So our job is to try to reduce the chance of that happening. But I have had sellers walk away from a buyer because they, they just don't like the buyer because they've just put in a, an insulting offer. So we have to reduce the chance for them to get insulted in the way that we present the offer to them. So although you present a better offer, they may not like you already they might not of... yeah that is a risk of for the buyer to be putting in a low offer i've seen i'm sure connor has seen that too sellers walk away based on principle or buyers walk away based on principle right so if we can eliminate that or reduce that from happening um then we're doing our job okay great thank you yeah you're welcome um so if they are countering then there's going to be negotiation going back and forth, right? Whether it's price or contingencies or deadlines or closing dates, any of those things can be countered on. If they accept the offer, then we just begin contract to close and we get signatures. And if they reject the offer, we let the buyers know that it's, it, they can come back and present another offer. Try to get them back to the table. Our job is to sell the house. Um, someone put also putting names on offers alphabetically. You know, I've never done that, Debbie. I just kind of, I put them in on the seller side, the way that the deed lists them. Um, so we're helping right now, what we're doing is we're helping our sellers reach a decision, right? On how to move forward on who they're going to move forward with. We're making sure that we're reducing this whole, that whole piece of running your business with the risk and compliance. This is where this really is going to be important. We need to make sure that everything within this contract is compliant to our state regulations. We want to make sure that we're putting our seller in the least amount of risk possible the least amount of risk of something going sideways in this contract. Like, have I called the buy the, the lender? Have I, have I found out if we can counter on any contingency in there and remove it? If we can remove contingencies on a seller side, then we're putting our sellers in less risk moving forward with that contract. Does anyone have any questions on how to help our sellers reach a decision? I have a quick question about um, <clears throat> talking to the lenders. Um, you uh, mentioned they, you know, to check off and make sure that they're pre-approved and there's no no kind of hidden mysteries with the um, buyer's financial situation. What do they have an obligation to speak to you, the lenders? Is that just like you call up and say, "Hey, I've got these, I've got these buyers. Here's their names. Tell me what you know." Like, how does that conversation go? Yeah, you know, so when I call a lender about a buyer that I've received an offer on, this is the deal too. All of us want this buyer to go under contract. We all get paid when we close deals, right? 
And I'm not asking anything that, is, that they haven't shared with me. I'll have their pre-approval letter. And I'm kind of reconfirming that with them. So, you know, I'll call them up. I'll say, hey, Scott, I have a pre-approval here for, you know, Mickey Mouse. And they're wanting to put an offer in on 123 Main Street. It says here that they're doing an FHA loan. How solid is their financing? Is this a, a pre-approval or is this a pre-qualification? Have they submitted their documentation to you? And has that documentation been submitted to underwriting? They might, it may be that that buyer can fog a mirror with a credit score and they got a pre-qualification and that's what they're passing on with your offer. So if they say, well, I don't have any docs on them yet, but their credit score, blah, 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 it's based on their credit score, then that's not a very strong buyer and I need to have that information. I need it for my seller. Because now, if that's not a strong buyer, if they really just have given a credit score and they someone spit out a pre-qualification, um, do I want to put have my seller put their house off the market and risk this buyer? Are they risk worthy? I rarely, very rarely will have an, a um, lender not want to talk to me. Um, in New Hampshire, it is written into the contract in the boilerplate part of the contract that the buyer's lender can talk to the seller or the seller's agent. They know what they can and they can't disclose. But getting into the nitty gritty of the buyer's lender for your seller is extremely important. I also want to make sure that they can meet the deadlines because, you know, there's some, there's some cowboy agents out there that are going to want to get this guy under contract before Connor can get that house from me. And they might be putting dates on there that might, that lender is never going to meet. So we need to know that. So I will at that time also run through some dates. So if there's any kind of financing commitment dates or application dates or whatever your contracts look like and closing dates, if they put a 30 day close on there, can they really close that in 30 days? Because if my seller, if I'm now stacking up deals and my seller has to buy something and it's based off of selling this property, I, I need to know that if 30 days is going to happen or if it's, it's not going to happen. It's going to help my seller make the right decision. Maybe that buyer's agent didn't put that the seller has to sell their, the buyer has to sell a home in order to, to get this money. So I'm going to ask them too. Is this commitment based off of the seller, the, a buyer selling anything? Do they have to sell anything for this approval? Great question. Anybody else have anything on that? Okay. We're going to keep moving forward because we want to, we want to get this guy under contract. Um, so the next part here is really to talk about, you know, our ahas or things that might resonate with you from today's session on you know, making and receiving offers, like has your thinking changed or what are some thoughts or things that you might be thinking about differently than before we started at nine o'clock? I feel like I kind of knew the general idea. I mean, obviously I've never closed anything, not yet, but there are so many questions to ask that I would rather my buyers or sellers know upfront that some surprises could come. And it's just, it, it's conversation. Like, you know, I mean, at the beginning, you're not warning them, but just explaining to them that this could be a possibility and to be prepared. And I just think that having all those questions that you were stating is such a good thing to have because as a new agent, you know, I mean, I think I, you know, I've bought a house, I've bought a condo, I've sold a house, but it's just so helpful. Absolutely. That's a great one. Um, and I'm so grateful that Connor brought up the expectations right from the beginning, because that really, it all starts there, right? Setting the right expectations up front in your, in your initial conversations with a buyer or seller. That's a, um, another point. I'm going to give you guys some free advice that may, save a couple deals and some relationships. And so, especially on the buyer's agent side. So when you submit an offer, right? And maybe you go back and forth um, in terms of counter offers and then, you know, buyer sends over a response 
and all of a sudden the listing agent calls you back and says, yes, the seller will agree, right? A lot of times there's a cleanup on the contract that needs to be done, updating this up. You know, initially you went over in writing, maybe you've gone back and forth in writing, but there's a cleanup, right? We all know that until the deal is fully executed by all parties, it's not a deal. So hear me clearly. So what's your first response? Listing agent calls you back and says, yes, seller, seller will accept that. And she says, clean up the offer, get the buyers to sign it and get it back to me and I'll have the seller sign it, right? So the buyer's agent calls the buyer and says, oh my God, Susan, congratulations. They accepted the offer, like so excited. I'm going to redo the, you know, I'll revise the contract right now. I'm going to send it over and get you to sign it. Okay, great. And, and what's Susan doing? She's waiting for that email and she's also popping champagne. <laughs> yeah. So excited that they just got the house. She's calling her family, calling her friends, s- signs the contract, gets it over to the listing agent, listing agents, you know, trying to get it signed. And then what happens? Another offer slips in before they've signed. And all of a sudden the listing agent calls Susan and says, Susan, I just want to let you know, we just received another offer. My seller wants to, wants to, you know, look at this offer and negotiate. If you guys want to come back with a different offer and what do you have to do? You have to call that buyer back and say, put the champagne on ice. We got a problem. And that buyer is going to be so upset, angry, pissed, whatever. And they're going to take it out on guess, guess who? That was your fault. They're going to take it out on their buyer's agent's fault. So here's what you do. When you say, when you initially call and you say, Susan, just want to let you know, congratulations. Looks like, looks like they're going to take this offer, but hang on one second before you celebrate, we got to get this thing finalized and we got to get this thing in writing because anything can happen. I'm going to revise the contract. I'm going to get it over to you. You're going to sign it as quickly as possible. I'm going to get it over to the listing agent. Until we get this thing signed, this is not a deal. I just want to warn you, anything can happen. Another offer can slip in, something can happen. Okay, I get it. I totally get it. Okay, I'll sign it as soon as I get it. Get it back. It's not until you get that contract signed that you can call Susan back and say, pop the champagne. Things are looking good. We've got a deal, signed contract. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. So let's say I... Is if it's signed and they have it in hand, is it valid even if I have their deposit check in my hand? To me, yes. Could okay. you if if you haven't turned over the deposit check, because you know it depends on what check it is. Are, are you are you late on the initial deposit? But I mean, once you've got a contract, it's signed. Now, could you be in default because you haven't turned the deposit in, that's another story, but that's different than another offer slipping in. You're still in first position. But I was, oh, sorry. I was just thinking because of distance. Well, you know, like, let's say I couldn't get the check to the seller's agent, you know, like within an hour or, you know. Well, typically it depends on how it's written, right? I mean, obviously in Rhode Island, it's a thousand dollars to make the offer. You know, you've got it all written down in terms of when the deposits are due. So if there's a thousand dollar check that's due, they better be FedExing that or wiring that right away, you know, so you can get this stuff done. But what I'm talking about is, you know, you're in this big negotiation, you're back and forth and, you know, the listing agent calls you and says, all right, we got a deal this happens. You call the buyer, you say, I'm going to send over the revised contract, pop the champagne, we'll get it. And then something else slips in. So now we, we, we do not communicate that way because until you've got a signed deal, it goes back to setting the expectations. You let them know ahead of time, because if in that scenario that happens, right. And I tell Susan, we don't have a deal until it's signed. And let's say another offer does slip in. And I call her back and let her know oh, another offer just slipped in. She's, she understands she may not be happy, but you've already told her that this could happen. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. Cause they're going to, you know, I have had that happen. And the wife was like, well, I didn't sign yet because I was making dinner. I'm like, well, you need to stop making dinner. So if you have a, you have a verbal agreement and you guys are kind of decided on both sides of the house momentum you got to get that that stuff signed right away you t- and you tell them stop whatever you're doing can you stop and sign this within the next five minutes because i'm going to sit at my desk and wait for it 
so I can deliver it back. Okay. The other thing with the, the escrow deposit, you're putting in the number of days to deliver that. I do backup offers all the time. So if my if I come, you go under agreement with Connor today on this property, and tomorrow my buyer wished that they had put one in and they want to get a backup offer in and it gets signed as a backup offer and it's better than your offer, all you have to do is miss a deadline and that seller can kick you out and, and now the other person can go in first position. You are responsible for everything that happens in that contract. So if you're putting dates in there that you can't meet, don't put them in. Make sure that you can meet them and that they're realistic. And and the the escrow it's the escrow check is a big one all the time. Um, I practice in New Hampshire and Maine, and in New Hampshire, I find that agents are a little bit more relaxed about it. Unfortunately, in Maine, if that's not in there by the date by five o'clock, that agent is calling you. So if escrow checks are important, they are an integral part of the con of the contract. Any deadline. Um, anybody else have any ahas from today or things that they might like to share? I love loyalty contract. Was it loyalty contract? Was yeah, that? that's what I call it. I love that. I yeah. also heard, what did, it, what did it, my, I, I sent that out to my team and they threw out a relationship agreement. Love that. Which is another one. Yeah. As opposed to, I need you to come in and we're going to sign a buyer's agency contract. Well, that doesn't sound fun. Oh, well, yuck right? But a loyalty agreement where we're agreeing to work with each other. Yep. You know what I like about that too, is this is a bilateral contract. And, you know, right now we are in such a strange world and people are getting upset because, you know, they're tired of COVID. There's a lot of political stuff happening. People are on edge. And so we need to do a couple things. We need to give people grace if they're having a time in their life when they're stressed out. But we also have to be clear. So I like loyalty agreement because it is a two-way contract. It's not just them hiring you, meaning they can fire you. That's not what an agency agreement is. So I thank you. I, I use the loyalty one and especially with um, buyers where um, getting them to to sign because the signing is important. It, it, it really can anchor in moving forward. Um, mine was the expectations, some of the expectations that you're setting up front right away, especially the a deal could fall apart or a deal they could get a backup offer in or something could happen. Um, I do like that one a lot. Well, and, was, and, I'll, and I'll say, you know what? We've lost clients in the past. It hasn't been recently. We've lost clients because of that. That happens to someone, you tell them they have a deal, they're calling family, they're popping champagne, and then all of a sudden you have to call them back and let them know that another offer slipped in and you didn't prepare them. They're going to blame you and chances are they're going to fire you. They don't want to work with you. Like They think you dropped the ball when in fact you didn't. Yeah. That's real. And that, st and that stings too, because not only oh. do you not get the deal, but you lose a client. Yep. And, and, and they're going to tell people. So we, we need to give them good things to tell it. And it's so painful when we do lose a client. It's going to, guess what guys, it's going to happen. It happens to everybody from time to time. What we're doing with all of your training is that you're just reducing the likelihood of that happening by honing your skills. You know, um, let me see here. Did I go backwards? We did ahas. Back to our, you know, we've seen this slide before, like every day, right? But it's so important what we need to be having our goals and our, your goal is 10 contacts added to your database every day, right? And that means 10 good contacts, garbage in, garbage out, quality in, quality out, okay? You need their contact information. I like to remind people that the person that we talk to the most in our head is ourselves in our heads. And we can have, we can put objections when we're on the phone with people that aren't there. Like they don't want to give me their contact information. <laughs> they usually don't care. You just have to ask for it, right? They don't want to have an appointment with me. They, they might, 
they, they very well could. And if they don't, then you ask them again the next time you talk to them. But we've got to add contacts into our database. Um, and we're putting notes in there so that we know where they are in their life cycle, in their wave of, you know, remember we, I don't know if you guys remember, but the wave was, they bought at the top and then the wave goes down. That's the least likelihood time for them to buy, but then they're going to go back up. So we're asking life event questions when we're on the phone with people so that we can track where are they in the next likelihood time for them to make a move, right? Are they starting a family? Are they getting divorced? Are they getting married? Are they upsizing? Are they downsizing or correct sizing? However you want to word that. Do they need a second home? What is happening in there? Are they retiring? What are the life events happening? And then we're going to log that into their contact in the, in the database so that the next time you call them, you can ask about that and ask leading questions that will give you information so that you are there. Because as they start giving you the indications that they're getting closer to being ready to contact again, to, to contract again, now you increase the, the frequency with which you're gonna be reaching out to them with value. Okay. Um, Shanice, my aha moment is taking extra steps to verify things and asking questions as the listing agent to ensure everything is moving accordingly, especially with making sure the time for the time frames are going to be met on the buyer's end. Yeah, that's a good one. You know, we have to ask a lot of questions in this business. That's for sure. We're, t we're having 10 conversations a day. We're writing 10 handwritten notes and we're previewing 10 homes a week. Okay. The handwritten notes are powerful, you guys. It, you know, this is not a difficult business. It, a lot of it is simple. But doing things, small things done consistently add up to big things in the long run. So it's setting up, you know, your 10, your, your 10 contacts, conversations, handwritten notes and previews is, is setting up your habits, your daily habits that we've talked about before. It's setting up your schedule and your routine. So you're consistently doing small things that will in the long run have a big impact. And the reason that we're putting adding contacts and having conversations, that's lead generation, guys. That's what that is. Because right from the very beginning and the first session of Ignite, Gary Keller tells us dealing with business never takes the place of finding business. That is the sticky note that I keep on my monitor at my, I'm at my home office today, but at my office office. That's what I read every day when I sit down at my office. That's the first thing that I read every day, that dealing with business never takes the place of finding business. Okay. So I know that you guys have a script book, which really, you know, scripts can be an intimidating word. All that scripting is, is conversations, right? We need to be able to have intelligent conversations on lead generating, on uncovering motivations on identifying objections with buyers and sellers. We need scripts on closing deals. You know, we're gonna go back into an environment where we're doing a lot more home inspections than we've been doing recently. And we need to be able to keep those deals together at the same time. So maybe you have a buyer that's asking for things during that period and the sellers, probably, you know, first reaction is not going to want to do it. And we have to negotiate again over those inspections. And your conversation might just start out with, you know what, Connor, you have a seller that wants to sell and I have a buyer that wants to buy. We need to work together. How can we work together to keep these two parties to the table? Right? Or, you know what, your seller has their perspective and they're right. And my buyer has this perspective and they're right. How can we meet in the middle to make all of this happen? So we practice these conversations so that when you're in the moment, you're not trying to think of what to say because we don't want to practice on our customers and our clients. So we practice with each other. Okay. We need to speak in terms the customer understands. That's another reason to have scripts and conversation practice so that we're not just pulling out all the acronyms, right? And when we practice our conversations, 
we're internalizing that, those conversations and it's built confidence for the next time that we get on the phone. So if you don't have a script partner, guys, get out there and find one. They're out there. And, you know, there's people on this call that are from different market centers that may also be looking for a script, prep, uh, script partner. So I encourage you to, you know, definitely find somebody from a different market center. They're going to give you a different perspective because they're hearing things from their leadership that might be a little bit different from the things that you're hearing from your le leadership. Okay. And I, I want to remind you too, as we're making our calls, do not call people on the do not call list. On the regional Ignite Facebook page, there is more information on how to avoid doing this. Okay, and I'll remind you that should you call somebody on the do not call list, your script is, I'm so sorry, Connor, let me take you off my list. I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay. And if you're having a hard time with um, finding that information, go to your leadership. We don't want to be calling people that have asked us not to call them. Okay. And... Um, so I'm not going to do the um, scripting with you today. You guys can do that on your own. Um, I do encourage you to actually do it, though. It's important. Um, and to create your daily success list. I create a list every day. I have my notebook, and I, I have my list of what I need to do. And what doesn't get done, I put onto the next page. But remember that when you're creating your list every day, remember the big rock conversation where we have every, well, all these things for growing our business and running our business that we have to do every day to be like successful agents. We put our big rocks in first and we do those first. And do you remember what the big rock is? What's your biggest rock? Lead generation. Every day. That's your big rock. You can fit in the sand and the gravel and the small rocks all around the big rock. But if you fill it up with sand and the small things first, you can't fit your big rock in there. So you put your big rock, you throw that down first and you do it. You do your lead generation, you fill your pipeline so that you can have an, a great income to bring back to your family. Okay. That's going to wrap me up for the day, people. Uh, we do have a few more minutes left. So if anyone has any questions or any, anything else that they want to share, I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you, Connor, so much. I appreciate you being here with us today. Thanks, guys. Thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> I appreciate that. Susan, thanks again. Talk soon. Yeah, you bet. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.